Eugene, once the mightiest hero in history, undergoes an involuntary reincarnation orchestrated by the demon king Venomzard, transforming into a noble youth named Eugene in a distant future world. Liberated from the burdensome duties of a hero, Eugene resolves to relish his second chance at life, particularly during his time at school. Despite his newfound freedom, Eugene faces scorn from his brother Gaius, along with disappointment from his parents and teachers who deem him a failure. Unbeknownst to him, Eugene carries the immense power of his past life, inadvertently evolving into a formidable warrior. In navigating the complexities of his reincarnated existence, Eugene grapples with familial and societal expectations while gradually discovering the latent strength within him, setting the stage for an unforeseen journey of self-discovery and redemption. Once upon a time, there was a man named Eugene, who wielded a remarkable sword adorned with the majestic figure of a lion. As he held his sword in hand, a wise dragon appeared before him and commended Eugene for his admirable skill. The dragon spoke of a formidable foe, an immortal demon known as Venomzard, and acknowledged Eugene as the greatest hero in history for defeating this menacing adversary. It was a moment of triumph for Eugene, as his courage and prowess resonated throughout the realms, etching his name into the annals of legendary heroes. Upon triumphing over Venomzard, Eugene expressed his gratitude to the dragon who lay injured on the ground. The dragon, sensing Eugene's lack of elation, inquired about his seemingly subdued mood. In response, Eugene confirmed that the dragon's observation was indeed accurate. The dragon went on to share a poignant revelation with Eugene. It spoke of Eugene's grandfather, a revered hero in his time, and how the dragon had come to fulfill the old hero's dearest wish, to vanquish the demon immortal. Having achieved this monumental feat, Eugene's heroic journey had left him feeling drained and burnt out. The dragon conveyed the weight of the legacy Eugene had shouldered, emphasizing the toll it had taken on his spirit. Acknowledging Eugene's fulfillment of his grandfather's wish, the dragon discerned that Eugene might be contemplating the conclusion of his heroic tale. Expressing genuine regret, the dragon recognized the toll the journey had taken on Eugene. In a generous gesture as a token of appreciation for Eugene's triumph over Venom Zard, the dragon, despite its impending demise, offered to grant Eugene any wish he desired. In response, Eugene humbly expressed his heartfelt desire. He wished for a family from the dragon. It was a poignant plea, a testament to the deeper yearnings that resided within Eugene's heart after his arduous quest. Eugene, showing respect, submitted himself before the dragon. However, the dragon, with a sense of urgency, declared that the time had come, expressing a lack of regrets as it blurted out information about a secret art, divulging it without forethought. The dragon clarified that the unfolding process could not be halted midway. It was an irreversible secret art. Intrigued, Eugene sought to understand more about this mysterious secret art. In response, the dragon disclosed that it was a closely guarded secret passed down through generations within the Demon King's lineage. Elaborating further, the dragon explained that it was the clandestine art of reincarnation, a mystical and exclusive ability held only by the relatives of the Demon King. The dragon advised Eugene to break free from merely continuing his late grandfather's narrative. Do you want to know the name of this manga, along with all the manga names of the recaps we did in our channel? How about also the chapter numbers our recaps end? You can simply ask the names in our Discord community for free, or become a donor, to get them all in one place. You can either be a donor in Patreon, or be a member in our YouTube channel. Just scan this QR code, or go to the link in the description, to become a donor. Moreover, becoming a donor automatically makes you a VIP member of our Discord server, with over tens of thousands of members. Instead. It suggested embracing a fresh beginning by reincarnating into a new body, allowing him to craft his own unique story. Soon after, Eugene found himself on the floor, gradually waking up. Before him stood a boy, who promptly began sharing details about Eugene's health, indicating that a new chapter had begun in his life. The boy's words marked the beginning of a journey for Eugene, a journey where he could weave his own tale with his own hands. Shortly after Eugene regained consciousness, a group of girls approached, expressing concern as they inquired about everyone's well-being. They mentioned hearing a noise and sought assurance that everything was okay. The boy explained that Eugene had fallen from the stairs, prompting the girls to grow more worried. The boy mentioned his suspicion that Eugene had hit his head hard. As Eugene awoke, he questioned his surroundings and how he had arrived there. Confused, he asked the boy about the location, expressing uncertainty about whether it was the same demon immortal's castle where he had previously resided. The concerned girls promptly offered to fetch a medical box for Eugene. As they hurriedly went to get it, Eugene took a moment to inspect himself in a nearby mirror. He gently touched his face, pondering the surreal circumstances that brought him to this unfamiliar place. Contemplating the situation, Eugene questioned whether he was truly in the real world. 
Examining himself more closely, he observed changes in his appearance. His hair and eye colors were different than before. Perplexed, he wondered if some mystical force had restored his youth, or if something else altogether was happening to him. Approaching the dining table, Eugene was astonished to find an array of sumptuous dishes laid out before him. The sight left him in awe, and he could not help but remark on the lavish spread so early in the morning. Expressing his surprise, he mused about the opulence of the food before him. In a moment of realization, Eugene speculated that he might have been reincarnated into the body of Julius von Carlyle. The discovery of his transformed body, and the unfamiliar surroundings of a new house with a new family, left him utterly stunned. The unfamiliarity of the situation added to the sense of wonder and amazement that enveloped Julius as he tried to comprehend the intricacies of his new existence. Seated at the dining table, Julius enjoyed his meal while observing a boy, a lady, and another boy engaged in conversation. The elder gentleman, addressing the boy named Gaius, who had assisted Julius earlier, commended him on achieving a perfect score on his test once again. The lady, expressing her pride, mentioned that Gaius had consistently held the top position since enrolling. She praised his helpful nature and highlighted his tendency to lead the way in various activities. The familial atmosphere and the exchanges around him painted a picture of warmth and support in Julius's newfound environment. The lady and the elder gentleman both offered their blessings to Gaius for his consistent academic success. Julius, observing the exchange, downplayed the significance, stating that it was not anything particularly special and there was no need for such exuberance every time. In his contemplation he began to form an understanding that the lady and the elder gentleman might be his mother and father respectively. Additionally, he identified Gaius, the young man in the conversation, as his little brother. The unfolding familial dynamics added another layer of intrigue to Julius's newly awakened life. Julius reflected, noting that it appeared he had been reincarnated as a baby in this unfamiliar world. He mused that, despite his hero status, his awareness and sense of self seemed to vanish, leaving his body to operate on autopilot. However, he found the situation somewhat peculiar, as he could not recollect anything from his life up until the age of 15. Acknowledging the gaps in his memory, Julius decided that, for the time being, he needed to observe and piece together the puzzle of his newfound existence. Julius's father addressed Gaius, expressing pride in him as a valuable member of the household. Turning his attention to Julius, the elder explained that he, being the older one, had experienced a fall down the stairs earlier that morning, which explained his somewhat dazed demeanor. Julius's father went on to share a moment of vulnerability, admitting that recently, a teacher had conveyed concerns about his grades suggesting that graduating might prove challenging with his current academic performance. He admitted feeling a sense of shame in light of this revelation. The family dynamics unfolded, revealing both moments of pride and challenges within the household. The father continued, expressing his discontent, stating that it was very presumptuous for him to even share the same air as the family, considering himself a disgrace to the household. Julius, taken aback, pondered whether parents were typically that harsh toward their children. Suddenly. Gaius rose from his seat, asserting to his parents that he did not want to hear such words anymore. The father, seeking an explanation, inquired about the change in Gaius's demeanor, while the mother defended their perspective, stating that they were only thinking about his well-being. The family conversation unfolded, revealing a mix of tension and concern within the household. Following the family discussion, Julius held a deep admiration for his brother, believing in Gaius's capacity to protect him. However, Gaius disrupted this perception stating that he did not have an older brother and had always considered himself an only child. This revelation left Julius grappling with a sense of denial regarding his own existence. As Gaius prepared to depart for school, Julius expressed a strong desire to accompany him. Eager to go together, Julius suggested they share the journey. However, Gaius, distancing himself, expressed reluctance to be seen in public with Julius. He proposed that Julius take a separate carriage, emphasizing the need for discretion. This unexpected turn added a layer of complexity to the relationship between the two brothers, leaving Julius with a mixture of confusion and a longing for connection. Expressing his dismay, Julius conveyed to Gaius that he found the situation quite cruel. He shared the sentiment that just when he believed he had found a new family, it seemed they did not care for him. As he made his way towards Aina Royal Academy, Julius could not shake the feeling of being unwanted. Upon reaching the academy, Julius recalled from his vague memory that at the age of 15, he had attended the same school as his twin younger brother. Reflecting on this, he mused about the new student life that awaited him as he walked towards the classroom. 
The mix of emotions and uncertainties colored Julius's journey into this unfamiliar chapter of his life. Behind the school building, a group of individuals approached Julius. One of them inquired whether he had brought the money that day. Another, adopting a more menacing tone, suggested that to avoid any harm, it would be in Julius's best interest to hand over the money willingly. The tense encounter unfolded, hinting at potential trouble for Julius in the school environment. In response, Julius asserted that they did not need to interact with him. He explained that Julius, presumably his previous identity, had always been coerced into similar situations. The guys, dismissive of his explanation, insisted that he should stop talking nonsense and simply hand over the money before resorting to his habitual crying. The tense exchange highlighted a history of coercion and hinted at a pattern of behavior that Julius seemed familiar with. Faced with the threatening situation, Julius called out to his brother for assistance. However, Gaius, upon glancing in his direction, chose to distance himself and leave the scene. This unexpected turn left Julius shocked and disheartened. Okapau Chan, one of the individuals present, became visibly angry at Julius for seeking help from his younger brother. The onlookers, observing Julius's plea for assistance, dismissed it and expressed their indifference. Julius, feeling a deep sadness, became the target of Chan's anger, who insisted that Julius must hand over the money. Attempting to enforce his demand, Chan threw a punch towards Julius's head. However, in a surprising turn of events, Julius activated a skill, leaving Chan visibly injured after the attempted punch. The unfolding events showcased a mixture of rejection, disappointment, and an unexpected display of Julius's abilities. Witnessing Julius's unexpected display of skill, someone remarked that he seemed like a superhero. In response, Julius explained that he anticipated pain, so he simply chanted enhanced magic to mitigate the impact. However, the other guys grew angry, dismissing the possibility that someone like Julius could use advanced magic. They claimed he was a failure in magic and accused him of lying. Undeterred, Julius clarified that it was merely a magical enhancement, urging them not to overthink the situation. The confusion and disbelief among the onlookers added to the complexity of the encounter. Advising the agitated group to calm down, Julius attempted to defuse the escalating tension. However, Chan vehemently declared that forgiveness was not on his agenda. He asserted his intent to kill Julius, emphasizing that Julius was already considered dead. In response, Julius clarified that he had merely reincarnated and extended a hand in goodwill. With a simple gesture, Julius lightly touched Chan with just one finger, causing him to collapse. Seizing the opportunity, Julius acknowledged that Chan was the first to attempt harm since his reincarnation, expressing understanding and offering assistance. The encounter took an unexpected turn as Julius showcased his newfound abilities and extended an unexpected hand of help. Approaching the fallen Chan, Julius placed his hand on Chan's mouth and activated his healing magic. Almost immediately, Chan began to recover, prompting others to inquire about the power Julius had previously displayed. Julius casually revealed that it was a form of healing magic. Intrigued, Chan questioned him further about this healing magic, to which Julius downplayed it, stating that it was a simple ability, something even children could use. The realization of Julius's magical prowess left the onlookers astonished. In response to the shock, they hastily retreated from the scene, startled by the unexpected demonstration of Julius's magical capabilities. Julius, despite healing them, mentioned that there were no words of gratitude from the others. Reflecting on the situation, he remarked that both enhancements and recovery were fundamental magical skills. However, he noticed a difference in the world he was currently in compared to the one he remembered. Contemplating the possibility of being in a different world line, Julius questioned whether it was the same world as before or an entirely new one. He acknowledged that his powers remained consistent with those of a former hero before his reincarnation. Considering the circumstances, he pondered the idea of not drawing attention to himself, wondering if it would be better to avoid standing out in this seemingly altered reality. As Gaius entered the academy, a chorus of admiration from the girls greeted him. They complimented his cool appearance, with one girl expressing amazement at meeting eyes with Gaius Kuhn. Meanwhile, Julius also made his entrance into the academy, drawing attention from the guys. One of them remarked that Julius was completely different from his older brother. Observing Julius' behavior, another guy noted that something seemed off that day. He shared that he had spoken to Julius, highlighting that Julius had greeted him in a manner that appeared more normal and subdued than usual. The unfolding scenes depicted contrasting reactions to the two brothers, as they navigated the dynamics of their new environment. Seated in his assigned chair, Julius became the focus of his classmates' curiosity, as they questioned what might be on his mind despite being the elder brother. Reflecting on Julius, he noted that she seemed to lack friends and appeared isolated from her classmates. Suddenly, a girl approached, 
and informed Julius that the seat he occupied was actually hers. Apologizing, Julius promptly stood up, expressing his regret. He mused that he must have been off by a seat based on his memories. The girl, displaying understanding, reassured Julius, stating that it was no issue. The brief encounter highlighted the nuances of adjusting to the social dynamics in his new school environment. Julius extended a friendly gesture, suggesting to the girl that they could become friends if she did not mind. She, taken aback by the unexpected proposal, found herself stunned. Sensing her hesitation, Julius humorously questioned if his appearance was not appealing. In response, the girl assured Julius that his looks were not an issue, and shared that she herself had a gloomy demeanor. Seizing the moment, Julius candidly mentioned feeling ostracized by everyone and lamented the time he believed he wasted, despite his own perception of being cute. The exchange revealed a glimpse of Julius's struggles with social dynamics and self-perception in this new environment. Suddenly, a voice emanated from outside the classroom, announcing the arrival of the class teacher. Instructing the students to quiet down, the teacher indicated that the class was about to begin. Acknowledging the teacher's presence, Julius remarked on her arrival, and the girl concurred, confirming that Julius's observation was accurate. As they both took their seats, the girl reflected on Julius's earlier comment about her being cute. She internalized the compliment, noting that it was the first time someone had spoken to her in such a manner. The anticipation of the upcoming class, mixed with this newfound interaction, created a unique atmosphere for Julius and his new acquaintance. As the teacher took the podium, she announced that the first period would focus on the historical events from 2,000 years ago, particularly delving into the story of the legendary hero named Eugene. Amidst this introduction, Julius unexpectedly climbed onto the table, raising his voice and attracting attention. Perplexed, the teacher inquired about the reason for Julius's sudden outburst, seeking an explanation. In response to the teacher's question, Julius dismissed any significant reason, stating that nothing had happened to prompt his sudden and loud reaction. The classroom dynamic shifted with this unexpected episode, leaving the teacher and students curious about Julius's behavior. Contemplating the information shared by the teacher, Julius found himself pondering the reality of the situation. He mused that the world he had reincarnated into seemed to be set in a time after the legendary hero Eugene had defeated the demon immortal. Transitioning to the second period, a male teacher entered the classroom and announced the focus on practical skills for the upcoming class. He further specified that the day's session would include regular magic measurements. The prospect of practical application added a layer of anticipation to the classroom atmosphere as the students prepared for the upcoming exercises. The teacher proceeded to generate magic in the classroom, explaining to the students that they would be engaging in magic power measurements. He instructed them to raise their hands and channel their magic power, with the resulting measurement displayed afterward. Observing this demonstration, Julius experienced a sense of deja vu, recalling that he had encountered a similar concept in his previous life. The familiarity of the magic power measurement process stirred memories from his past, adding a layer of intrigue to the current magical exercises in the classroom. The teacher directed the students to initiate the magic power measurement, and instructed them to step forward when their names were called. A student volunteered, stepping to the front as directed. The teacher then prompted him to commence the magic, and as the student channeled his magic power, the measurement displayed on the screen showed a modest 15. Observing this, Julius could not help but think that the guy's magic power was relatively low. Reflecting on his experiences from his previous world, he was confident that, for a 15-year-old, the average magic power value would typically be in the four digits. Considering the seemingly low number displayed, Julius wondered if, by such standards, the student might be considered a failure in the magical realm. The teacher announced to the student that he had passed the magic power measurement. However, Julius, upon hearing the teacher's words, was left shocked, misinterpreting the statement as the student having passed away. Amidst the confusion, the other students discussed the situation, expressing surprise at the apparent malfunction in common sense. They remarked that magic power was expected to be roughly equal to one's age with the passing criterion for 15-year-olds being 15. Reflecting on this, they realized they had overlooked a crucial detail, contributing to the label of being called failures. The unexpected twist in the assessment process left the students grappling with a sense of misunderstanding and the implications of their magical evaluations. Reflecting on the situation, Julius began to ponder if the machinery was malfunctioning or experiencing some issues. It was at this moment that a group of individuals arrived, each possessing their own magical powers that kept regenerating. The range of magical abilities varied among them, with some having a power level of 15, others 14, and one individual reaching an astonishing 21. The collective surprise and awe from the group indicated that reaching a power level of 21 was a rare feat. 
Witnessing the stunned reactions of those around him, Julius could not help but contemplate the unusual occurrences in that world. He noted how everyone seemed mesmerized when the magical power surpassed the threshold of twenty. Speculating on the situation, he mused about the potential anomalies or disruptions happening in the world, leaving him with a sense of curiosity and concern about what might be going wrong in that peculiar realm. Continuing his contemplation, Julius recalled a peculiar incident from his past life. As a mere one-month-old infant, he astonishingly possessed a magical power level of 100. This drew the attention of the teacher, Gaius von Carlyle, who was summoned to assess and verify Julius's extraordinary magical abilities. As the anticipation built, everyone around eagerly awaited Gaius's demonstration of his own magical prowess. The onlookers, including Julius's brother, could not help but wonder about the magnitude of Gaius's magical strength. In this moment of suspense, Julius directed his gaze towards his brother, curious to see the extent of magical power he possessed. The atmosphere was charged with expectancy, creating an air of excitement and intrigue among those present. As Julius's brother approached to assess his magical power, he laid his hand on the magical measuring device, and to everyone's amazement, the magical power surged to an impressive fifty. Gaius expressed his satisfaction, remarking on the remarkable strength and noting that it was three times the average. The revelation left the onlookers stunned, marveling at the extraordinary magical power displayed. Subsequently, the teacher called upon Julius von Carlyle, who, in this new life, was Julius himself. Stepping forward, Julius faced the eager crowd. However, instead of the anticipated respect, the others seemed skeptical and questioned his abilities. Disappointed by the lack of acknowledgement, the group openly disrespected Julius, underestimating his potential. The atmosphere shifted from awe to doubt, setting the stage for Julius to prove his magical prowess in the face of skepticism and misunderstanding. Stepping forward, Julius contemplated how a former hero should comport himself. His brother, in response, offered a succinct piece of advice, suggesting that Julius, who seemed to lack magical power, should consider leaving school. His brother was quite convinced of Julius's apparent absence of magical abilities. Acknowledging his brother's words, Julius concurred, expressing the realization that it indeed appeared as though he lacked magical power. He went on to share the emotional toll, noting that both his family and classmates harbored a strong dislike for him and his younger brother. The situation painted a stark picture of alienation and animosity, leaving Julius to grapple with the complexities of his identity and standing in the new world he found himself in. In a sudden recollection, Julius found himself seated in a chair beside a bed where a man rested. This man, identified as Ji-chan, conveyed a poignant message to Julius about the limited time he had left. Ji-chan urged Julius not to distance himself from others and advised him against adopting a solitary demeanor. Reacting to Ji-chan's words, Julius responded, asking him not to speak in such a manner. Ji-chan, lying on the bed, expressed apologies to Julius and regretted any trouble he may have caused. The exchange revealed a poignant moment of connection between Julius and Ji-chan, adding a layer of emotion to Julius's memories and contributing to the unfolding narrative of his past. Julius recounted that his grandfather, a former hero, faced a significant challenge when Ji-chan, the most powerful and esteemed hero in history, was defeated by the immortal demon Zard. The defeat plunged the people into despair, leading them to condemn the hero who could not overcome the immortal demon. Faced with this stigma, Ji-chan endured loneliness and was eventually banished from the city. Seeking solace, Ji-chan chose to live a quiet life in the mountains. Despite the isolation, he extended care to Julius, who had lost his parents in a great calamity. Eventually, Julius assumed the role of a hero, fulfilling his grandfather's wish to vanquish the demon immortal. However, instead of basking in glory, his grandfather, placing a hand on his head, advised him to live a life akin to an ordinary person. This narrative highlighted the burdens and sacrifices endured by the heroes in their quest to protect and redeem their legacy. Ji Chan, the grandfather, continued to impart advice to Julius, emphasizing the importance of leading a normal life, establishing a new family, and finding happiness, a promise made between them. Reflecting on this guidance, Julius acknowledged that he had indeed formed a new family in another world. However, he shared a lighthearted observation about his younger brother, describing him as handsome and cheeky, with an air of seeming superiority. In response to this dynamic, Julius, committed to his role as the older brother, humorously mentioned his determination to give his all in mastering magical powers, adopting a playful approach to strengthen the bond and camaraderie within the newfound family. As Julius placed his hands on the magic power tester and initiated the measurement process, a remarkable occurrence unfolded. His body began to emit a radiant glow, prompting a chorus of astonishment from the onlookers. The collective reaction of the group was one of bewilderment, 
with everyone expressing curiosity about the extraordinary luminosity emanating from Julius. Intrigued murmurs filled the air as the observers questioned the unprecedented brilliance surrounding Julius. The consensus among them was that the generated magical power exceeded anything they had witnessed before. Even the previously stunned girl remained in awe, her surprise deepening at the dazzling display unfolding before her eyes. The unexpected radiance added an element of wonder and mystery to the scene, leaving the onlookers eager to comprehend the nature of the unparalleled magical power Julius had unleashed. Julius explained that two thousand years had elapsed in the world he found himself in, a realm where the principles of magic markedly differed from those of his original world. Elaborating further, he disclosed the existence of special breathing techniques that absorbed magical elements from the atmosphere and transformed them. The concept of the magic power drill remained shrouded in mystery, with no one seemingly familiar with its nature. Observing the stunned reactions of his peers, Julius cast a glance toward his younger brother, who shared in astonishment the display of Julius's extraordinary power. Seizing the moment, Julius humorously remarked that he had finally gained a younger brother, emphasizing the importance of not underestimating his abilities. The playful declaration added a touch of camaraderie to the situation, as Julius embraced the dynamics of newfound sibling rivalry and mutual respect. Julius's power surged to such an extent that it obliterated all the machines in its vicinity, leaving the teacher and classmates visibly shocked and concerned. A chorus of disbelief filled the air, with everyone expressing amazement at the unprecedented display of magical prowess. Acknowledging the magnitude of his own power, Julius conceded that he might have gone a bit overboard. Despite attempting to restrain his abilities, the sheer force unleashed still resulted in an explosive outcome. Struggling to gauge the impact of the destroyed machines, Julius humorously questioned whether he needed to repeat the process. In response, Gaius, grappling with the astonishing spectacle, found it hard to believe that such an outcome was possible. Unfazed, Julius turned to Gaius, asking if he had witnessed the true extent of his capabilities. Gaius, utterly shocked, remained speechless, confronted with the undeniable proof of Julius's extraordinary magical prowess. Upon entering another class, a different teacher presented a magical circle and inquired if anyone recognized its significance. Julius, observing the magical formation, was prompted by the teacher to share his knowledge about it. However, the classmates, dismissive of Julius's capabilities, interjected, labeling him as a dropout and asserting that he lacked the capacity to tackle such an advanced problem. Another student chimed in, stating that the task was deemed too difficult for him. In this classroom scenario, the teacher's query exposed a lack of confidence in Julius's abilities, as his peers doubted his competence in handling intricate magical concepts. The dynamics set the stage for potential challenges and perceptions to be overcome as Julius navigated his way through the academic realm of his new world. Julius disclosed his current identity as Julius von Carlyle, attributing it to the secret art of the immortal demon through which he had reincarnated into the world. When asked about a magical question, Julius downplayed it as a basic fireball, deeming it incorrect. To his surprise, the teacher affirmed the accuracy of his response. The revelation left the other students in the class astonished. They could not fathom how someone they perceived as a failure could provide the correct answer to a challenging question that even they struggled to understand. Julius, seizing the moment, pointed out the apparent technological disparity between the magic of the present age, 2,000 years later, and that of his previous world. The unexpected turn of events added a layer of intrigue to Julius's character, challenging preconceived notions, and showcasing his unique perspective on the magical advancements in the new world. Julius approached the board where the teacher had drawn the circle, and with confidence, he completed the circle, pointing out that the teacher had only created half of it. This unexpected demonstration left the teacher surprised and the classmates in disbelief. The students, unable to comprehend how Julius had accomplished the task, accused him of interfering with the class. They questioned his ability to perceive and recreate the magical circle correctly. The teacher, already stunned by Julius's earlier response, now faced a classroom dynamic where preconceptions were being challenged, and a student once dismissed as a failure displayed unexpected proficiency in magic. The teacher acknowledged Julius's alteration of the magical circle, noting that despite reducing the number of lines, the power remained intact. Furthermore, he commended Julius for minimizing the activation time to the utmost limit and reducing magic consumption to a mere tenth, deeming the modified circle to be exceptionally elegant. Curious about potential alternatives, Julius inquired if his solution was the best. The teacher, still in awe, asserted that it was impossible for Julius to have created such a remarkable magic circle. The rest of the students, baffled by the unexpected turn of events, collectively expressed their confusion, questioning how Julius managed to craft such an extraordinary circle. 
The classroom atmosphere was now charged with intrigue and amazement as the students grappled with the newfound revelations about Julius's magical prowess. Seated at his desk, Julius's brother Gaius, visibly angered by Julius's actions, clenched a pencil in his hand, breaking it in frustration. Meanwhile, Julius, unfazed by the tension, enjoyed a meal before heading towards the classroom. Casually remarking on his post-reincarnation tendency to feel sleepy after lunch, Julius questioned what would come next after the break. As he entered the classroom, he immediately sensed an unusual commotion and noise emanating from within, sparking his curiosity. The contrast between Julius's nonchalant demeanor and the tense atmosphere in the classroom set the stage for potential conflicts and unexpected developments. In a distressing scene, a frightened girl stands while facing the disrespectful comments of a group of girls. The tormentors whispered among themselves, noting that the girl's long hair served as a cover for what they deemed as ugly ears. They continued their hurtful remarks, accusing her hair of being creepy. The situation escalated when one of the girls threatened to cut the victim's hair, producing a pair of scissors. The targeted girl, now on the verge of tears, implored the aggressor not to proceed. In her desperation, she called out for help, expressing both emotional and physical distress caused by the verbal abuse and impending harm. The unfolding events underscored the cruelty and impact of bullying, with the victim's plea for assistance intensifying the emotional gravity of the situation. Upon hearing her distress call, Julius swiftly arrived, offering support to the frightened girl and hastening away from the scene. As the aggressors searched for her, Julius cleverly moved in the opposite direction, effectively evading their pursuit. Recognizing the distressing situation, Julius remarked on the chaotic morning and expressed his inability to tolerate such behavior. In response to the inquiring bad girls, Julius, taking a protective stance, warned them about the danger of wielding a knife. Displaying a knife of his own, he deftly disarmed the threatening girl, leaving her shocked. When questioned about when he took the scissors from her, Julius calmly explained that he moved discreetly and managed the intervention with a slow, strategic approach. The sequence of events highlighted Julius's quick thinking and ability to defuse a potentially harmful situation. Julius explained that thanks to body strengthening, the swift movement took a mere 0.01 seconds, emphasizing that despite the impressive display, his reincarnated body still faced challenges in terms of speed. Acknowledging the limitations, he attributed the slower pace to the condition of his newly reincarnated form. In response to the questioning girl, Julius clarified that he was not intervening but merely warning her. The girl expressed confusion about his actions, prompting Julius to point out a violation of school regulations, her bangs covering her eyes. The exchange shed light on Julius's use of enhanced abilities and his inclination to maintain order, even in seemingly mundane situations. Having come to her rescue, Julius picked up a pair of scissors and inquired if he could trim her hair. She consented, granting him permission to proceed with the haircut. As Julius skillfully cut her hair, a noticeable transformation occurred, leaving her with a refreshed appearance. The classmates, witnessing the change, were collectively astonished by her newfound beauty. They openly expressed admiration, offering newfound respect for the girl who had undergone the transformation. The positive response extended to the point where others in the class expressed a desire to befriend her. Recognizing her not just for her external change, but also for the newfound confidence and positivity emanating from her. Addressing the girl who had been taunting her, Julius confidently remarked that there was no longer any reason for her to complain about the perceived creepiness of her hair. This statement elicited frustration from the girl, who became visibly angered by Julius's comment. Turning his attention to the girl whose hair he had cut, Julius complimented her, noting that she now looked incredibly cute. He playfully added that all their classmates were quite impressed and enamored after witnessing her transformation. The positive acknowledgement served to boost the girl's confidence and marked a shift in perception among her classmates, who now appreciate her newfound charm. Upon receiving Julius's assistance, the girl extended her gratitude, expressing thanks to him. Internally, she acknowledged developing a liking for Julius. Witnessing her happiness, Julius reciprocated the joy, feeling content with the positive outcome. Julius. Recognizing the girl as someone who had endured prolonged bullying due to being a half-breed with distinctive ears, commented on the unfortunate reality. He mused that even with the passage of 2,000 years, overcoming such deep-seated prejudices and mistreatment would likely prove to be a persistent challenge. This reflection highlighted Julius's awareness of societal issues and his understanding of the enduring nature of certain struggles. Entering the next classroom, Julius found a teacher waiting for the students. In the room, there were a few scarecrows strategically placed. The teacher explained that the purpose of the class was to gauge the students' magical abilities. By directing their magical prowess toward the scarecrows, 
the students could have their strengths measured. The teacher emphasized that the scarecrows were equipped with a protective mechanism to prevent them from breaking easily. This precaution ensured that each student had a fair opportunity to showcase their magical abilities without causing damage to the targets. Julius mentioned that the current activity was not something he had encountered in his past life. In response, the teacher suggested finding someone to provide a demonstration. The classmates collectively suggested Gaius for the task. Meanwhile, Gaius engaged in a conversation with a girl named Historia. During their exchange, Historia conveyed her admiration for Gaius, expressing that he looked exceptionally handsome that day. She remarked that his consistently cool and distinctive demeanor always stood out, setting him apart from his older brother. In return, Gaius shared his feelings, expressing deep and sincere love for Historia. The unfolding scene portrayed the straightforward and heartfelt connection between Gaius and Historia. Standing together, Gaius and Historia engaged in a romantically charged conversation. To everyone's surprise, Historia, in a bold move, planted a kiss on Gaius's cheek. Witnessing this unexpected display, Julius was left completely stunned, grappling with the realization of their intimate behavior within the confines of a classroom. The teacher, equally taken aback by the unexpected scene, shared in the collective astonishment. Meanwhile, the classmates, impressed by the couple's ability to flirt in a dignified manner, marveled at the audacity of their romantic exchange. They expressed admiration, acknowledging that even the teacher seemed unable to counter such an extraordinary and unexpected display of affection. The atmosphere in the classroom was charged with a mix of surprise, amusement, and appreciation for Gaius and Historia's unique romantic interlude. Observing his brother Gaius engaged with girls of that nature, Julius found the behavior quite unexpected. He mused on the surprising turn of events, contemplating the differences in Gaius's usual demeanor. Gaius, noticing Julius's gaze, playfully mentioned that someone appeared to be looking at them with envy. Seizing the moment, Gaius then turned to Julius, inviting him to share any thoughts he might have. In response, Julius curtly conveyed that he had nothing to say, opting to keep his thoughts to himself. The exchange highlighted the complex dynamics between the brothers, with Julius silently observing Gaius's unexpected interactions and choosing not to vocalize his thoughts on the matter. Turning his attention to a girl named Elise, Julius inquired about the person closely associated with his younger brother. Confused by the question, Elise responded, expressing her surprise at Julius's inquiry. She identified herself as Historia San, the eighth princess of the kingdom considered the noblest among the nobles, and mentioned being engaged to Julius Kuhn, which left Julius in utter shock as Julius Kuhn was the name in his new life. Struggling to recall, Julius admitted to forgetting that detail, prompting Elise to remark that he typically doesn't forget such things. This revelation left Julius contemplating the situation, questioning why his brother's fiancée would engage in flirtatious behavior with his older sibling. The unfolding conversation added a layer of complexity to the relationships and dynamics within the group creating intrigue and leaving Julius with unanswered questions. As Julius conversed with Elise, Historia arrived on the scene, questioning why he left her to whisper with that ugly girl. Elise, feeling apprehensive, quickly apologized to Historia. In response, Julius questioned Historia, asking what she meant, and boldly asserted that Elise was cuter than her. Elise, pleased by Julius's compliment, expressed her happiness. This declaration, however, angered Historia who demanded an explanation for Julius's words. In response, Julius questioned Historia about her actions, pointing out the contradiction in her behavior as she claimed to be his fiancé, while also engaging in romantic gestures with his brother. The escalating tension added a layer of drama to the unfolding interactions, with Julius confronting the complexities of the relationships within the group. In response to Julius's inquiry, Historia explained that she rejected the engagement imposed by their parents, deeming it a selfish decision. She emphatically stated that she only had eyes for Gaius and had no interest in having a bland and dropout older brother like Julius. Her candid remarks drew laughter from the rest of the group, with the guys playfully teasing Julius about his situation, suggesting he was unfortunate because his younger brother had won the affection of his own fiancé. Stunned by the turn of events, Julius processed the revelation that Historia had chosen Gaius over him. This unexpected twist added a layer of complexity to the relationships within the group leaving Julius grappling with a mix of surprise and realization. In response to the situation, Julius conveyed that if Gaius and Historia were in love with each other, he would gracefully step back. Historia, surprised by his statement, questioned his sanity, and asked if he truly would not mind if Gaius pursued a relationship with her. Elise, recognizing Julius's fiancé status, intervened, reassuring him that there was no need to get angry with Historia. Remaining composed, Julius reiterated that if his younger brother shared mutual feelings with someone else, 
he would offer his congratulations as an elder brother. This mature response reflected Julius's understanding and acceptance of the situation, adding a layer of emotional depth to the unfolding dynamics within the group. Gaius, in response to a perceived foolish statement from Julius, garnered attention in the class. Another classmate suggested that it would be better if everyone took their seats. Gaius acknowledged the suggestion, expressing his awareness of the presence of the teacher, referred to as sensei. He proposed the idea of turning the activity, which involved measuring the strength of magic power, into a one-on-one -on -one battle. This suggestion added a sense of excitement and anticipation to the class, showcasing Gaius's proactive and strategic approach to the situation. Following the exchange, Historia suggested that Julius be paired with an opponent for the match. This surprising proposal left Julius in a state of shock. However, Gaius responded, acknowledging Historia's request and agreeing to conduct the test as a one-on-one -on -one match. He outlined the rules, stating that the match would conclude when one participant either fainted or surrendered. This decision added a layer of anticipation to the upcoming magical test, with the dynamics between the characters unfolding in unexpected ways. In response to the suggestion of magical power measurement, Julius expressed to Historia that there was no need for a physical confrontation. However, Historia responded sternly, stating that Julius's constant annoyance was reason enough for a fight. She urged him to simply accept being beaten in the upcoming match. This exchange highlighted the tension between the characters and set the stage for a potentially intense confrontation during the magical power test. Expressing his frustration, Julius remarked that Historia was being selfish in her insistence on a physical confrontation. In response, Historia asserted that it was a form of punishment for embarrassing Gaius, and she intended to ensure that Gaius witnessed her defeating Julius thoroughly. Turning her attention to Gaius, she instructed him to watch the impending fight and witness her securing a decisive victory. This exchange added further tension to the upcoming match, with the characters' motivations and conflicts becoming more apparent. Seated and observing the unfolding events, Gaius attentively watched as Historia initiated the match. With a confident demeanor, Historia advised Julius to ready himself, asserting her intention to swiftly defeat him with a single move. Adding a dramatic flair to the moment, she reached for a stone and tossed it into the sky, proclaiming the imminent arrival of her strongest and most invincible summon. This declaration heightened the anticipation, setting the stage for an intriguing and potentially intense magical battle between Historia and Julius. The astonishment among the onlookers grew as Historia declared her intention to summon a guardian beast. A dragon materialized from the stone, leaving the guys in utter shock. Historia revealed it to be the family's generational guardian, a level 30 dragon named Salamander. The unexpected appearance of such a formidable creature had the onlookers questioning the princess's motives, speculating whether she intended to harm Julius. Addressing the dragon, Historia urged Salamander to reveal the harsh reality of life to Julius. In response to her command, Salamander unleashed a burst of fire toward Julius, intensifying the suspense and anticipation surrounding the magical confrontation. The unfolding spectacle painted a vivid picture of the power dynamics at play, with a mythical creature becoming a pivotal element in the ongoing magical test. As the dragon unleashed a stream of fire toward Julius, Historia gleefully observed the spectacle. Her classmates voiced their concerns, stating that she could not actually harm Julius Kuhn. Unfazed, Historia retorted, expressing indifference to the consequences, asserting that everything was the degenerate's fault. With a hint of mockery, she inquired about the taste of her salamander's premium breath, reveling in the apparent success of her summoned creature's attack. This exchange underscored the tension and rivalry within the group, with Historia taking satisfaction in her perceived victory over Julius. Asserting her satisfaction, Historia declared the attack as punishment for Julius's irritation, describing it as a sin of a felony that he should reflect on as if he burned charcoal. To her surprise, Julius emerged unharmed from the flames, commenting on the smoke. Historia, shocked by his resilience, questioned how he could remain unscathed by a level 30 fire. Casually, Julius remarked that her flame would likely suffice against amateur adventurers. Confused and irritated, Historia pressed him, questioning how the intense fire failed to harm him. This exchange revealed Julius's unexpected resilience and left Historia perplexed by the outcome of her summoned dragon's attack. In Julius's reflection, he asserted the formidable magic defense characteristic of a hero, brushing off the impact of a mere level 30 spell. Inquiring if the confrontation would persist, he prompted Historia. Responding with frustration, Historia claimed she had unconsciously held back, and then directed Salamander to unleash its power against Julius. As Salamander attempted to strike Julius, he executed swift and agile movements, avoiding the impending attack. Historia, witnessing his rapid evasion, was left in shock, pondering how he could move so quickly to defend against the fiery assault. 
This unexpected display of speed added a layer of intrigue to the ongoing magical duel, emphasizing Julius's prowess in the face of formidable magical forces. The onlookers, equally astonished by the spectacle, questioned whether Julius had managed to evade the attack without even budging from his position. Puzzled, they wondered about the unusual occurrence, exclaiming about the bizarre turn of events. Julius, seemingly unfazed, nonchalantly explained that predicting the trajectory of an attack made it easy to avoid. He threw a rhetorical question into the air, challenging anyone present to match such a feat. In response, the salamander ceased its fiery onslaught, prompting Julius to question the sudden halt in its magical assault. The unfolding scene continued to captivate the audience, leaving them in suspense about the outcome of the magical duel. As Salamander ceased its attack, Historia, determined to turn the tide, commanded the creature to employ their trump card. With that directive, Salamander took to the air, soaring above the battlefield. Seizing the opportunity, it lunged at Julius, and Historia urged the creature to crush him, intensifying the climax of the magical confrontation. The unfolding events kept the audience on the edge of their seats, wondering how Julius would contend with this new aerial assault. The assembled group of individuals found themselves in a state of disbelief, unanimously concluding that he had surely met his demise. Historia, joining the consensus, confidently declared that he had been transformed into minced meat, definitively marking the end of his existence. Abruptly, Julius rose from the ground, effortlessly grasping the salamander with a single hand. In a calm and collected manner, he conveyed that the previous assault was insufficient to secure his defeat. The onlookers, thoroughly taken aback by his ability to lift the salamander, expressed their shock and questioned the manner in which he accomplished such a feat. Julius, in response to her inquiry, calmly explained that he was fortifying his body using aura, a technique involving the incorporation of natural energy from the atmosphere. This energy, he continued, was then converted into explosive kinetic force within his body. Historia, showing surprise, mentioned that she had never encountered such a concept before. Undeterred by her lack of familiarity, Julius responded with assurance, promising to demonstrate the technique to her. Subsequently, he threw the salamander towards Historia. As the salamander descended and neared her, Historia lost her balance and began to fall. In a swift and protective move, Julius swiftly reached out, catching her in his arms to prevent her from hitting the ground. Ensuring her well-being, he inquired if she was okay. She responded by questioning the timing of his arrival to rescue her and insisted that he let go, branding him a degenerate. Perplexed by her reaction, Julius asked her why she was treating him that way, considering he had just saved her. Meanwhile, the onlookers engaged in conversation, discussing the impressive display of power they had witnessed. Some speculated that he might be Gaius's elder brother, expressing awe at his extraordinary abilities. Showering him with praise, they went on to assert that Julius was notably stronger than his younger brother, deepening their admiration for his strength. In the midst of the magical spectacle, a sudden revelation unfolded as Gaius, with unexpected gravity, declared to Historia that they should end their relationship. A stunned silence hung in the air, as Historia tried to pass it off as a mere jest. However, the situation took an unexpected turn when Julius, appearing out of nowhere, interjected into the conversation. He questioned the commotion, seeking an explanation from the bewildered pair. In response, Historia, agitated, demanded he mind his own business and leave them be. The tension in the air thickened, leaving an air of uncertainty about the reasons behind Gaius's unexpected decision. Gaius's brother approached him with a heavy heart, sharing the news of his recent breakup. Julius, surprised by the sudden revelation, inquired about the apparent shift, recalling the moments when the two were deeply affectionate not long ago. Gaius, with a hint of sarcasm, suggested that Julius spoke up even more and labeled him as somewhat deceitful. Further explaining the situation, Gaius pointed out that his now ex-girlfriend had always been Julius's intended fiancée. This revelation prompted Julius to declare his intention to annul their engagement. Despite this decision, he urged Gaius to maintain a positive relationship with his brother. In response, Historia expressed her concern, mentioning that if Julius proceeded with the annulment, she would face criticism from Otusama. This unexpected twist added a layer of complexity to the already intricate situation, leaving the characters grappling with the consequences of their intertwined relationships. Julius questioned Historia, reminding her of the instances where she seemingly flirted with his younger brother. In response, Historia suggested that, as a true man, he should find it in himself to laugh and forgive a woman who had strayed. Julius, however, countered by expressing that it need not be him, emphasizing that there were other potential partners for her consideration. Historia, attributing the unfolding events to Julius, claimed that everything occurred because he was deemed the child of prophecy by a renowned fortune teller. 
This revelation added a layer of complexity to their conversation as the characters grappled with the implications of fate and their choices in the intricate web of relationships. Stunned by the revelation, Julius immediately reached out to Gaius to discuss what he had just learned. To his surprise, Gaius was nowhere to be found. Historia, noticing his distress, clarified that Gaius was absent and in a gesture of sincerity, clutched his feet. She assured him that she had no intentions of continuing any romantic involvement with their charming younger brother. In an attempt to emphasize the gravity of their situation, Historia explained that the Eighth Princess served as a crucial link between their three families. She warned Julius that severing the engagement would not only jeopardize their relationship, but also diminish his standing. The unfolding drama left Julius grappling with the intricate dynamics of family ties and the delicate balance of his own position within the context of their interconnected lives. Expressing his frustration, Julius remarked on the annoyance of the situation, acknowledging that even in a hypothetical reincarnation, bothersome problems seemed to persist. Despite this, he expressed a desire to foster a better relationship with his newfound younger brother. Meanwhile, on the other side, Gaius found himself in a state of anger. Channeling his frustration, he repeatedly struck the wall with force, declaring the situation unforgivable. Each punch against the wall reflected the intensity of his emotions and the gravity of the conflict that had unfolded. The contrasting reactions of the two brothers painted a vivid picture of the emotional turmoil and complexity within their evolving family dynamic. The following morning, Julius woke up and from his bed expressed satisfaction with the quality of his sleep. As he entered the gallery, he noticed that the sun had yet to rise. To his surprise, he found his younger brother engaged in a practice session with another individual. Observing the scene, Julius overheard the practice partner advising his brother. The person emphasized that mastering a particular posture took time and could not be achieved in just a few days. Despite the challenge, he commended the young master's innate talent, likening him to a sponge for his ability to absorb information effortlessly. The unfolding morning presented a glimpse into the disciplined efforts and talents of those around Julius, setting the tone for the day ahead. Expressing his gratitude, Gaius thanked the individual assisting him in his training. Meanwhile, Julius stood in the gallery, observing his younger brother's early morning dedication. He marveled at the fact that Gaius was putting in much effort at this hour and commented on the young master's potential, believing that he could achieve great heights. Addressing Gaius, the mentor noted that despite his current progress, there would come a time when he needed to become more serious in his training. In response, Julius questioned the teaching methods, wondering about the identity of the teacher imparting what he deemed as useless information. He expressed dissatisfaction with Gaius not utilizing enhancing techniques and not harnessing his aura, leaving him puzzled about the purpose of their training regimen. The gallery scene unfolded with a mix of admiration, concern, and curiosity about the nature of Gaius's martial education. Continuing his thoughts, Julius emphasized the importance of incorporating genuine practice into Gaius's training, stating that without it, the efforts would merely resemble swordplay. Concerned about Gaius's progress, he leaped from the gallery to the ground. Upon landing, Julius conjured a magical towel and placed it on Gaius's head, commending him for his dedicated efforts. To his surprise, Gaius admitted to not sensing Julius's presence at all. Undeterred, Julius praised Gaius for his commitment to early morning practice, highlighting the admirable quality of ambition. The scene unfolded as a blend of mentorship, magical gestures, and acknowledgement of Gaius's work ethic in the pursuit of improvement. Persisting in his resolve, Julius conveyed his intention to impart genuine swordsmanship to both Gaius and the unidentified individual nearby. Expressing his disdain for the perceived arrogance of the teacher, Julius asserted that he would provide instruction in true swordsmanship. The teacher, confident in his abilities as the kingdom's strongest knight, welcomed the prospect of learning from Julius. In response, Gaius found Julius's comment disrespectful and expressed his disagreement. Julius dismissed the teacher's claims, deeming his swordsmanship ineffective and labeling him as nothing more than a neighborhood uncle. The scene unfolded with a mix of determination, skepticism, and a touch of humor in evaluating the credentials of the supposed strongest knight. The teacher harbored a disdainful opinion of the supposedly ineffective neighborhood uncle, leading him to confront Julius with accusations of being a lowlife. Brimming with anger, the teacher expressed outrage at what he perceived as an insult to the proud knightly title he held. Witnessing the escalating tension, Gaius intervened, advising the teacher to calm down. However, the situation took a more intense turn as the teacher unsheathed his sword, declaring his refusal to tolerate further insults. He swung the weapon at Julius, who adeptly defended against the attacks. Observing Julius's agility in dodging the teacher's serious strikes, 
Gaius marveled at his brother's skill. In a bold retort, Julius taunted the teacher, criticizing his sluggishness and even humorously remarking on feeling sleepy. He asserted that improvement would remain elusive unless he found a more proficient instructor. The teacher, infuriated by Julius's provocations, retaliated with a forceful sword strike. However, in a surprising twist, Julius suddenly activated his creation magic, altering the dynamics of the confrontation. Upon activating his creation magic, a sword materialized in Julius's hand. As the teacher attempted to strike him, Julius skillfully used his newly formed sword to block the attack. To everyone's surprise, the force of the impact caused the teacher's sword to shatter, leaving him sprawled on the ground. Both the teacher and Gaius were left in a state of astonishment. Gaius, expressing his shock, noted that the sword emitted a glow before the teacher was sent flying. Turning his attention to Julius, Gaius inquired about the nature of the extraordinary feat, seeking an explanation for the unexpected outcome of the confrontation. In response to the teacher's astonishment, Julius casually explained that it was just a simple parry. The teacher, still stunned, sought clarification by asking if Perry referred to the technique outlined in the swordsman's instruction book. He went on to describe it as one of the ultimate secret techniques. Dismissing the teacher's notion, Julius replied that the so-called ultimate technique was merely the basics of swordsmanship. In his thoughts, Julius reflected on the mention of magical technology and swordsmanship, realizing that not only their magical capabilities, but also their sword skills, seemed to be in a state of deterioration. The conversation unfolded with a blend of causal explanation and a hint of contemplation about the state of their magical and martial traditions. Observing the shattered remains of his sword, the teacher directed his inquiry toward Julius, questioning when he had started carrying that particular weapon. In response, Julius casually informed the teacher that he had just crafted the sword moments ago. Expressing profound disappointment, the teacher mourned the loss of the strongest and oldest sacred sword a cherished heirloom passed down through generations in his household. Saddened by the unexpected breakage, the teacher's emotions were evident. Seizing the opportunity to remedy the situation, Julius offered to create another sword for him. Activating his creation magic once again, Julius promptly conjured a replacement for the broken sacred sword, aiming to alleviate the teacher's sorrow and restore the significance of the cherished family heirloom. The teacher marveled at Julius's ability to create a sacred sword in an instant. Julius handed the crafted sword to the teacher, who noticed its striking resemblance to his own broken sword. Expressing gratitude, the teacher acknowledged the uncanny similarity. However, Gaius interjected, expressing a sense of unease and stating that things were not entirely good. Perplexed, Julius inquired about the source of the concern. Gaius, finding it strange, remarked on the noticeable transformation in Julius, emphasizing his newfound strength and describing him as simply unthinkable. In response, Julius humorously acknowledged his reincarnation as the hero Yuge, recognizing that it might be hard to believe. The exchange unfolded with a mix of admiration, gratitude, and a touch of skepticism regarding the inexplicable changes that had taken place. Julius invited Gaius to join him for breakfast, expressing his intention to make pancakes for them. However, Gaius responded, rejecting the notion of Julius acting like a big brother after all this time. He explicitly stated that he did not acknowledge Julius as his older brother and promptly left. In response to Gaius's departure, Julius commented on his younger brother's reserved and non-affectionate demeanor. The interaction highlighted the strained relationship between the two, with Julius attempting a gesture of familial warmth that was met with clear resistance from Gaius. In the subsequent class, the teacher positioned at the front informed the students about the upcoming summoning activity. Elise turned to Julius, clarifying that the term summon servant was synonymous with a familiar. Expanding on the details, she added that, being first-year students, they were about to engage in a ritual specifically designed for summoning monsters that would eventually serve as their familiars. The students attentively absorbed the information, preparing for the summoning ritual with a mixture of curiosity and anticipation. Julius commented that even regular students have the ability to summon familiars, acknowledging his lack of prior knowledge since he had never been a student before. Turning to Elise, he complimented her, noting that she was both knowledgeable and cute. The teacher chimed in, explaining that a familiar was essentially a mechanism through which a monster representing the summoner's strength was called forth. He elaborated, mentioning that the summoned monster aligns with the summoner's unique qualities and potential. The classroom discussion unfolded with a mix of insights into the summoning process and casual banter among the students. The teacher explained that a familiar could be summoned by channeling one's magic power into the magic circle of the summoned servant spell. Julius found this technique intriguing 
considering it something he had never encountered even 2,000 years ago. Following the teacher's instructions, the class proceeded to perform the summoning ritual in an orderly fashion. As a student approached the magic circle, Julius, observing the process, expressed his curiosity, wondering what creature would emerge from the summoning. The anticipation in the room heightened as everyone eagerly awaited the outcome of the ritual, eager to see the familiar that would be conjured. As the student touched the magic circle, he underwent a transformation into a white wolf with a level of 15. The teacher, noting the outcome, wrote on the copy and informed the student that he had passed, considering a level of 15 as average. Julius, however, found the level to be surprisingly low, contemplating that he had observed a similar trend during his encounter with the salamander. He pondered whether the overall levels of monsters in that world were declining, expressing concern about the potential implications of this observed trend. The classroom atmosphere buzzed with evaluations and reflections on the summoned familiar's level and broader observations about the state of monsters in the world. Following a request from Gaius, the teacher agreed to let him participate next. The other students eagerly anticipated Gaius's turn, expressing their curiosity about the familiar he would summon. Gaius, turning to Julius, requested him to observe the process. In response, Julius assured Gaius that he would be watching and wished him good luck. As Gaius approached the magic circle, the teacher directed him to enter. Gaius complied, stepping inside the designated area for the summoning ritual. The classmates observed with heightened interest, awaiting the outcome of Gaius's summoning as the magical energies swirled around the circle. The atmosphere in the room was filled with a mix of excitement and anticipation. Observing Gaius's summoning, the onlookers were astounded by the impressive amount of magic he displayed. Gaius underwent a remarkable transformation, becoming a griffin with an astounding level of 50. The classmates were quick to praise him, declaring him the champion of heaven and acknowledging that a level 50 creature truly deserved the title of a monster. Seeking feedback, Gaius turned to Julius, asking how he found his newly summoned familiar. In response, Julius humorously referred to griffins as ugly birds flying around during his forest walks. Elise interjected, emphasizing the rarity and precious nature of griffins in the monster world. Undeterred by the banter, Julius encouraged Gaius, expressing confidence that he could summon an even more extraordinary creature. In response to Julius's challenge, Gaius inquired whether he could summon a monster surpassing the griffin. The classroom buzzed with excitement as the students discussed the magical prowess displayed and speculated on the potential for even more formidable familiars. Reflecting on his past as a hero, Julius considered that he never felt the need for a familiar and consequently never summoned one. As he approached the magic circle, his classmates teased him, suggesting that only a level one slime would be the best he could conjure. Unfazed, Julius responded acknowledging his lack of experience in summoning but expressing his determination to give it a try. In an attempt to summon a familiar, Julius instructed himself to gather magic power from the atmosphere using a magical power drill and direct it toward the magic circle. The classmates observed with a mix of curiosity and amusement as Julius embarked on his summoning endeavor, eager to see the result of his magical efforts. Upon entering the magic circle, an intense burst of light emanated, leaving everyone stunned. Witnessing the radiant light, the onlookers were perplexed, questioning the source of the unusual light rays that seemed to extend toward the sky. As the light subsided, it revealed Julius's complete transformation. He had turned into a massive dragon. The classmates were astonished, unable to determine the dragon's level due to its unknown status. The magical spectacle left the onlookers in awe, contemplating the extraordinary nature of Julius's summoning, which surpassed all expectations. The collective astonishment of the onlookers was palpable as they expressed shock at the dragon's colossal size and its mysterious, unknown level. Gaius, taken aback, voiced his confusion, admitting that he had never encountered such a familiar before. Julius responded to the bewildered crowd, stating that they were unfamiliar with the dragon. To everyone's surprise, the dragon itself spoke, acknowledging the rarity of people knowing its true name and revealing that few had witnessed its real form. The unexpected revelation left the group in a state of disbelief, further stunned by the fact that the dragon possessed the ability to communicate. The magical spectacle continued to unfold, leaving the onlookers in awe of the extraordinary and unexpected nature of Julius's summoning. In response to the astonishment of the onlookers, Julius confidently asserted that, indeed, the dragon familiar had the ability to speak. The others were taken aback, expressing disbelief since it was uncommon for familiars to possess knowledge of human language. They found the unknown level and the ability to speak highly unusual, prompting them to question the nature of the situation. Even the teacher, usually composed, was stunned by the sight of the dragon. Julius proceeded to enlighten them about the legendary creature. Mentioning a dragon that had instilled fear in people since ancient times, he referred to it as Cliffoth, the evil dragon emperor of disasters, 
an apex being and a ruler feared by all living things. The revelation added an air of mystique and dread to the already extraordinary summoning event. The dragon conjured by Julius's magic revealed itself as Venom Zard, an immortal demon. Expressing surprise at the meeting, Venom Zard remarked to Julius that it had been too long. Julius, in response, acknowledged that it had indeed been two thousand years since their last encounter. As the revelation unfolded, the onlookers found themselves overwhelmed, falling to the ground, and expressing feelings of sickness. Concerned for their well-being, Julius questioned what was happening to them. Venom Zard explained that the adverse effects were a result of his potent magic power affecting them. The unexpected consequences of the magical presence heightened the suspense and left those present grappling with the aftermath of the extraordinary summoning. Julius pointed out that merely talking caused a significant surge of magic, powerful enough to incapacitate lower-level individuals. Acknowledging Julius's observation, Venom Zard expressed satisfaction that Julius had exercised restraint in his magical strength, even after being reincarnated. He commended those who managed to remain standing in his proximity. However, Julius redirected the conversation, noting that it was not the time for praise. He emphasized that everyone present was struggling due to the overwhelming effects of Venom Zard's magic. The concern for the well-being of those affected heightened the tension in the situation, creating a sense of urgency to address the unexpected consequences of the powerful magical presence. Venom Zard, realizing the unintended consequences of his magic, acknowledged that those affected were not hostile towards him. Julius suggested that he should try to contain his magic power temporarily to alleviate the situation. In response, Venom Zard understood the request and proceeded to perform magic on himself, resulting in a bright light. Suddenly, the dragon transformed into a stunningly beautiful girl. The unexpected transformation into a beautiful girl was attributed to the excessive magic power that had caused people to fall. The onlookers were left in awe and shock, questioning how the dragon had metamorphosed into such a peerless beauty. The sudden turn of events added an element of surprise and curiosity to the unfolding situation. Curious about his new appearance, Venom Zard inquired with Julius about how he looked. Puzzled by the transformation, Julius wondered why Venom Zard had become a girl. Nevertheless, he reassured her that the change should be acceptable, noting that it seemed she had successfully suppressed her magic power. The unexpected turn of events continued to baffle and intrigue those present, as they grappled with the surprising transformation of the once formidable dragon into a graceful girl. Abruptly, Gaia stood up and confronted Julius, accusing him of dishonesty. He asserted that high-level servants possessed the ability to transform into human forms, deeming it implausible for Julius to accomplish such a feat. The atmosphere became charged with skepticism and tension, as Gaius challenged the credibility of Julius's explanation, introducing an element of doubt to the unfolding scenario. Julius described the creature as one emitting tremendous magic power and possessing eyes that struck fear into those who beheld them. He explained that merely laying eyes on it could allegedly destroy one's spirit due to the overwhelming horror it exuded. Julius emphasized that this entity posed a threat to the lives of others solely through its existence. The vivid depiction sought to convey the profound impact and danger associated with encountering such a formidable being. Julius directed his younger brother's attention towards the transformed Venom and asserted that she was now his friend. Venom, however, countered, stating that only Julius had the privilege of referring to her as such. Gaius interjected, declaring that the match was not yet concluded. He proposed settling the matter of whose familiar was superior through a servant battle, adding an element of competition and anticipation to the unfolding events. Gaius directed his griffin towards Venom Zard oblivious to their respective levels. In her thoughts, Venomzard deemed their lack of knowledge about levels as foolish. As the griffin approached, Venomzard swiftly struck, causing Gaius to be taken aback and express surprise. Stunned, Gaius observed as his griffin not only flew away but also departed from the immediate vicinity. The unexpected outcome added an element of unpredictability to the ongoing servant battle. Venomzard disdainfully remarked on the horrid nature of having a worm-like existence stand before him. Julius, acknowledging Venomzard's discerning abilities, commented on the demon immortal's perception, noting how the mere act of glaring could be considered equivalent to a deadly magic technique. The exchange highlighted the significance attributed to subtle expressions and gestures in the context of their confrontation. Overcome with sadness, Gaius expressed disbelief, questioning whether it was plausible for a familiar to possess such extraordinary power with just a stare. He accused Julius of deception. Pondering if the servant summoned by Julius shared the same potential as himself. The atmosphere was charged with disappointment as Gaius grappled with the realization that Julius's familiar surpassed his expectations, introducing an element of rivalry and tension into the unfolding narrative. Gaius persisted in expressing his astonishment, 
emphasizing that the potential exhibited by Julius's familiar surpassed his own by 10,000 times. He directly addressed Venom Zard, seeking confirmation and questioning whether she was asserting that Julius's capabilities exceeded his own. The revelation fueled Gaius's disbelief and intensified the growing tension between the characters involved. Julius conveyed to Venom Zard that his younger brother had become disheartened, requesting her to exercise some restraint. In response, Venom Zard claimed ignorance about the opponent's shortcomings and expressed continued dissatisfaction with the world's overall level. She remarked that, as anticipated, the only thing capable of stirring her heart was a battle with Julius, who had been the hero in his previous life. This exchange highlighted the ongoing tension and set the scene for the anticipated confrontation between Julius and Venom Zard. Julius inquired about Venom Zard's true identity, questioning whether she was genuinely a demon immortal. In response, she affirmed her status as a demon immortal, asserting that her body undeniably possessed those characteristics. However, she concurrently acknowledged the apparent contradiction, stating that despite the undeniable traits, her appearance did not entirely align with the typical expectations associated with a demon immortal. This revelation introduced a layer of complexity to Venom Zard's character and left Julius contemplating the peculiar nature of her existence. Venom Zard elaborated on the nature of servant summoning, revealing that it did not always bring forth the authentic entity. Instead, it resembled a ritual that materialized a duplicate of the original being. Furthermore, she explained that these summons seemed to be bound by an inherent code of unwavering obedience, preventing them from defying the directives of the summoner. This information sheds light on the intricacies of the summoning process and the dynamics between summoners and their summoned beings. Continuously listening to her explanation, Julius grasped the complexity of her existence. Venom Zard clarified that while her physical form bore the characteristics of a demon immortal, it simultaneously deviated from being a true representation. Presently, she emphasized her role as a devoted servant, affirming her allegiance to Julius. This revelation added another layer of understanding to the intricacies of their connection and the unique nature of her presence in his world. Suddenly she conjured her magical abilities, causing all the men in the vicinity to collapse onto the ground. Witnessing this, Julius was taken aback and in astonishment, inquired about what she had done to them. In response, she calmly explained that she had simply cast a spell to induce a temporary slumber, ensuring they would not pose any hindrance. The magic she employed was gentle, causing no harm to their well-being. Instead, it gracefully lulled them into a peaceful sleep, allowing for a brief respite. Baffled by the sudden magical display, Julius sought an explanation, questioning the significance of the unexpected event. In response, Venom Zard calmly explained that the intense emotions stirred by their reunion after 2,000 years were causing her heart to race with excitement. To mark this special occasion, she chose the magical spectacle as a form of celebration. She went on to express her playful desire to engage in a friendly match with him. With a smile, she affectionately referred to Julius as her hero, addressing him by the name Eugene, creating an atmosphere of camaraderie and anticipation for the impending interaction between the two. Julius conveyed that absolute obedience was not an expectation from them. In response, Venom calmly stated that the impending battle could be seen as a form of entertainment, treating it as a mere caprice or whim. This perspective added a layer of lightheartedness to the situation emphasizing the idea that the forthcoming clash was more of a recreational activity than a strict obligation to follow. Julius, feeling a tinge of boredom, expressed that he had been in a relaxed state for quite some time. Suddenly he transitioned into his original mode, declaring it as his serious demeanor. In this mode, he instructed Venom to prepare for a fight, signaling a shift from the previous casual atmosphere to a more intense and focused engagement. The moment ensued as they engaged in combat, with the surrounding men peacefully asleep. Julius, addressing Venom, suggested that they could dispense with any tedious conversation and swiftly proceed. This conveyed a desire to move past verbal exchanges and delve directly into the action, intensifying the focus on their ongoing battle. Venom Zard swiftly advanced toward Julius, a radiant light emanating from his backside. Without hesitation, Julius harnessed his magical abilities and drew his sword. When Venom delivered a forceful strike, Julius adeptly blocked the attack, swiftly retaliating with a powerful swing of his sword. The impact sent Venom flying backward, and as she regrouped, she acknowledged Julius's effortless parry with an expectation befitting his skill. In response to her compliment, Julius graciously acknowledged her words, expressing gratitude in a kind tone. Seizing the moment, he attempted to strike her from above. The swift motion resulted in her arm being severed from her body. Undeterred, Venom praised the hero's sword acknowledging its effectiveness in strategically targeting and claiming his right arm. In a continued display of admiration, she remarked on the wonderful execution of the move, appreciating the prowess of the sword crafted by the hero. Suddenly, 
Venom Zard harnessed her magical abilities and successfully regenerated her right arm. Addressing Julius, she asserted that the confrontation was not concluded with just one attack. In response, Julius acknowledged her regeneration, remarking that the restoration of her right arm was a notable feat. High in the sky, Venom Zard declared that she was not done yet, expressing that the enjoyment of their airborne duel was only just beginning. Playfully, she informed Julius that it was now her turn to strike. Infusing her magical strength into the spell, she conjured thousands of fists, making her attack inescapable. She proudly stated that her multitude of punches equated to the impact of his singular punch. Meanwhile, in a distant location, two girls observed the unfolding spectacle. One of them sat in a chair, holding a magic ball that allowed her to sense the events within its radius. She alerted the other girl to the enormous surge of magical power spreading in the western sky. Astonished, the second girl admitted she had never felt such energy before. She further described the sensation as an ominous premonition, expressing concern that the overwhelming power could potentially bring about the destruction of the entire world. Subsequently, Venom Zard unleashed her barrage of thousands of punches in one, targeting Julius's face. To her surprise, Julius stood unfazed, the impact having no discernible effect on him. Calmly, he informed her that the relentless punches failed to inflict any harm upon him. Venom Zard contemplated the situation, perplexed by the fact that despite unleashing a barrage of thousands of punches, he could not fathom how his opponent maintained such an undisturbed demeanor. Julius directed a question toward her, seeking clarification on whether his recollection was accurate. Had she, as a demon immortal, experienced a decline in strength? He went on to mention that in the past two millennia, their strengths were evenly matched, but presently, the demon immortal seemed to exhibit a noticeable decrease in power. Julius could not help but express his bewilderment, finding the circumstances quite peculiar. Julius found the situation quite amusing, and remarked that it was genuinely funny. Unaware of the magical connection, Venom Zard then pointed out to him that he had not realized that Julius and Venom Zard were linked by a magical path. Curious, Julius questioned her about the nature of this magical connection. In response, she explained that through this mystical link, she shared her immense power with him. Expanding on the explanation, she added that the magic oath served as a seal, forging a strong bond between the master Julius and the demon, Venom Zard. Perplexed by the concept, Julius inquired about the meaning behind the magical connection. In response, she explained that using his power for simple calculations resulted in a doubling of his status. She reassured him that this did not indicate her weakness, but rather emphasized Julius's exceptional strength. Despite her clarification, Julius remained unconvinced, expressing that he did not perceive such enhanced strength. Venom Zard acknowledged the considerable power difference attributing it to the nature of their abilities. She added that given the significant gap in their powers, feeling the difference might be challenging. However, she found the timing of their discussion intriguing and suggested conducting a test to validate her explanation. She proceeded to announce that she intended to unleash his complete power for examination. Continuing her dialogue, she emphasized the importance of him reassessing his own capabilities. Subsequently, she harnessed and activated the entirety of his power leaving Julius visibly stunned by the unexpected surge. A remarkable transformation followed as she morphed into a formidable bat, attaining heightened strength. It was, in fact, the activation of his malevolent immortal dragon mode that contributed to her newfound and potent abilities. Julius contemplated the immense power he had just acquired, acknowledging the enduring strength of the demon immortal. He recognized that the formidable force he now possessed was a testament to the undiminished might of the demon immortal. In response, Venom Zard addressed him expressing her realization of his capabilities and questioning how he would fare against her unleashed full power. She conjured a magical ball and hurled it in Julius's direction. Upon impact, the sky burst into flames, creating a dazzling display of fiery brilliance. Spectators witnessing this extraordinary event were left in utter bewilderment, collectively wondering about the origin of the spectacular occurrence unfolding before them. Their shock was palpable as they questioned whether the astounding display emanated from the Academy adding an extra layer of mystery to the already perplexing scene. Following that, Venom Zard turned her gaze towards Julius. However, in an unexpected turn of events, Julius swiftly escaped the magical constraints. He expressed his amazement, stating that it seemed the attack had caused no harm. Julius questioned the source of the seemingly feeble assault, wondering if it truly originated from the once-proud demon immortal who had previously subjected him to suffering. He further remarked on the surprising weakness of the attack, expressing his genuine astonishment at its ineffectiveness. Venom Zard acknowledged Julius's response, appreciating the manner in which he handled the situation. She emphasized that, 
with the demon immortal's full power, he had truly become her master. Continuing the conversation, she noted that the battle was just beginning to pique her interest. In response, Julius asserted that the outcome had already been determined. Curious, Venom Zard inquired about what had been decided. Julius replied, expressing surprise that she had not noticed. Taking advantage of the moment, Julius swiftly severed her from the center. He then explained that he could exploit her slowness to gain the upper hand in their exchanges. Julius expressed his astonishment at having effortlessly overcome the Demon King, who unleashed her full power. He went on to mention that it felt somewhat underwhelming, adding a tinge of disappointment to his observation. Venom Zard, in response, erupted in laughter and commended Julius, stating that it was truly an extraordinary feat, asserting that Julius was, in fact, the strongest individual in history. Julius, acknowledging Venom Zard's praise, made a lighthearted comment about the energetic spirit displayed by Venom Zard, despite the noteworthy fact that she had been cut in half. Venom Zard expressed her happiness in serving Julius as a loyal servant. In response, Julius inquired about her intentions to stay, to which she affirmed positively, mentioning that it was Julius who had summoned her. Julius, demonstrating eagerness, conveyed his willingness to remain by her side until he was no longer needed. Extending a helping hand to her, Julius assisted Venom Zard to her feet, expressing gratitude for her presence. He added that he could truly savor the moments of that era, attributing it all to her. Julius conveyed his appreciation, acknowledging that the enjoyable aspects of his life during that period were largely thanks to her. Venom Zard responded, commenting on how Julius's face had matured into a nice expression. Having fully recovered, her previously severed body had successfully regenerated. Extending her hand towards Julius, she encouraged him to take good care of her, underlining the importance of their newfound connection. Descending from the magical circle, a man approached Julius and conveyed that it was a coincidence that the prophecy had indeed come true with the emergence of the ominous power. It seemed as though this power had awakened. Initially addressing Julius by his new life name, Julius, the man then used his previous life name, Eugene. He emphasized the urgency for Julius to confirm as soon as possible whether or not he was a suitable vessel for the upcoming era. Abruptly, Julius took flight from the area on a quest to locate his old home in the jungle. Voicing his thoughts, he remarked that it should be around there somewhere. Suddenly, he discovered his old dwelling. Expressing satisfaction, he commented that it had been 2,000 years, but fortunately, he had implemented a protection spell to ward off decay. He added that the home was still in good condition. Julius spoke of a man endowed with extraordinary talents in various martial arts, his magical prowess surpassing even that of immortals. His healing abilities were lauded as equal to the king of the spirits, and he held the esteemed title of the strongest in history, revered as a hero. However, in the face of the formidable demon immortal Venom Zard, this remarkable individual was vanquished. Despite his unmatched skills, the man suffered a resounding defeat. Undeterred, Julius recounted how the defeated hero discovered solace in the form of an orphan, whom he lovingly raised. As his aspirations for conquest crumbled, a profound sense of responsibility overcame him, plunging him into the depths of the mountains where he chose to dwell. Haunted by the weight of his past actions, the hero's retreat into seclusion became a poignant tale of despair. The people, once hopeful and inspired, now shared in the hero's burden of responsibility. It was a stark reminder that even the mightiest could be humbled, and redemption was a journey often fraught with unexpected turns. Continuing his tale, he recounted how the seasoned man shared the entirety of his life's knowledge with the young orphan, starting with the intricacies of swordsmanship, delving into the secrets of magic, exploring the nuances of martial arts, and imparting the wisdom of healing powers. The mentor passed on his skills and experiences. Julius went on to explain that this act was pivotal in bringing an end to the prolonged era of darkness. The once nurtured boy ultimately emerged triumphant, overcoming the formidable demon immortal Venom Zard. Astonishingly, the victorious individual turned out to be none other than the once defeated but now immortal hero. Seated by his grandfather's grave, Julius reflected on the extraordinary turn of events. He shared with his departed grandparent the revelation that such teachings were now part of history classes, finding it rather peculiar. It was a testament to the unexpected nature of knowledge and how the threads of history weave through the unlikeliest of tales. Placing the bottle beside his grandfather's grave, he began to reminisce. Upon reflection, he recalled a moment when he harnessed a newfound power. With a mere thought, two swords materialized in his hands. He explained that one of them was the void sending off spirit's sword. Feeling a connection to his late grandfather, Julius decided to test the mysterious powers of the sword. He called out to his grandfather using the enchanted blade, and to his astonishment, his grandfather appeared before him. 
expressing surprise. The elder acknowledged that Julius cleverly exploited the incompatibility between the Holy Sword and the Magic Sword. He went on to reveal that he had effectively dismantled the metaphysical barrier separating the realms of the living and the dead, making it effortless to summon his soul. In a casual manner, his grandfather remarked that Julius remained as peculiar as ever. Overjoyed to be reunited, Julius could not contain his happiness at seeing his beloved grandpa again. Approximately two centuries ago, Julius's grandfather handed him an envelope, instructing him to open it. The elder explained that the envelope contained insights into what would transpire after his demise. In response, Julius, during that moment in time, implored his grandfather to prevent any unfavorable events foretold in the letter. However, the elderly man, sensing his limited time left, acknowledged the urgency. Taking a curious gaze at the contents within the envelope, Julius absorbed the gravity of the information presented. It was then that his grandfather disclosed a poignant instruction. After his passing, Julius was to visit the orphanage specified in the letter. The grandfather's final wish was imparted with a sense of solemnity, leaving Julius with a significant responsibility to fulfill in the wake of his grandparents' departure. At that moment, his grandfather appended that he was bequeathing all his assets and fortune to Julius. Alongside this revelation, the elder reiterated his heartfelt plea. In return, Julius was asked to lead a commonplace and ordinary life, foregoing the path of becoming a hero and avoiding the tribulations that befell his grandfather. Seated on chairs, Julius and his grandfather shared this profound conversation, the elder sipping on his drink as he conveyed his earnest wishes. Despite the grandfather's repeated advice, Julius reflected on the times he had defied this council, bravely confronting and defeating the formidable demon immortal Venomzard. The elder acknowledged this fact, admitting that Julius, against all advice, had emerged victorious as a hero. He further explained that this heroism in turn contributed to making the world a better place for all to live in. In response to Julius's laughter, the grandfather remarked that he had always been the kind of child who excelled after receiving instruction, suggesting that subjugating the demon immortal was likely an effortless feat for him. However, a sudden shift in the conversation ensued as the elder expressed a profound sense of remorse, feeling as though he had burdened Julius with the curse of his own regret, distorting the trajectory of his life. Deeply apologetic, the grandfather extended a sincere apology to Julius. Unfazed by the revelation, Julius reassured his grandfather, questioning the validity of such remorse. Julius emphasized that he pursued his desires willingly and without regret, including his quest to subjugate the demon immortal. Trying to ease the elder's guilt, Julius conveyed that he harbored no feelings of regret or resentment. However, the grandfather, in a surprising confession, revealed that after achieving his goal of defeating the demon immortal, he had contemplated taking his own life within the confines of the demon's castle on that fateful day. The disclosure added another layer of complexity to the narrative, shedding light on the emotional struggles that both Julius and his grandfather endured. Upon inquiring, Julius asked his grandfather if he witnessed that moment. In response, the grandfather affirmed that he did, expressing gratitude towards the demon immortal for sparing his life. Touched by this revelation, Julius extended a sincere apology for the emotional turmoil his actions might have caused on that particular day. However, the grandfather insisted that he, in fact, should be the one apologizing. Julius further confided in his grandfather, sharing that he had managed to overcome and eradicate all his guilt and profound regrets. Nevertheless, a lingering uncertainty persisted within him pondering whether his grandfather was resting peacefully in heaven. This internal contemplation highlighted Julius's ongoing struggle to find closure and assurance regarding the well-being of his departed grandfather. The conversation took a turn when the grandfather admitted to another lingering regret. Eager to know more, Julius encouraged his grandfather to share this undisclosed remorse. To Julius's surprise, the elder revealed that the lingering regret was Julius himself. Stunned by this revelation, Julius absorbed the unexpected confession. His grandfather went on to advise him that in his second life, he should engage in activities he loves without a care in the world. The grandfather asserted that living without regrets would involve pursuing one's passions wholeheartedly. Responding to this counsel, Julius expressed skepticism about the feasibility of living without care. Undeterred, the grandfather acknowledged the difficulty, but encouraged Julius to seek out those pursuits that would bring him unbridled joy. He emphasized the importance of finding something he could proudly declare as a lifelong desire, urging Julius to actively seek out and pursue those meaningful endeavors. Upon hearing his grandfather's advice, Julius expressed his eagerness to embark on such a journey. In response, the grandfather likened the myriad choices available to the countless stars illuminating the night sky. He urged Julius to persist in his quest until he discovered the pursuit that would make him the celebrated Eugene of the future.
a wish that resonated as the elder's sole desire. Julius, feeling a sense of sadness, assured his grandfather that he would do his utmost to fulfill this profound wish. In turn, the grandfather gently suggested that Julius need not visit him for a while. Julius acknowledged this, expressing regret for not making use of most of the possessions his grandfather had left behind before his passing. However, the grandfather reassured Julius, emphasizing that such trivial matters should not be a cause for concern within their family. He underscored the strength of their familial bond, prompting Julius to acknowledge the wisdom in his grandfather's words. Reflecting on his past life, Julius remembered a poignant moment when his grandfather disclosed a surprising revelation about his parents. During their final conversation, the elder revealed that Julius's parents were not, in fact, deceased. He recounted an incident from a few years back when a fire broke out. Miraculously, amidst the chaos and tragedy, his grandfather discovered a child with no known relatives, Julius. Expanding on the narrative, the grandfather clarified that no one had perished in the fire, implying a glimmer of hope that Julius's parents might still be alive. This unexpected revelation added a layer of complexity to Julius's understanding of his own history leaving him with newfound questions and possibilities about his family's fate. Continuing the heartfelt conversation, the grandfather reiterated that Julius was not biologically related to him. Unfazed by this revelation, Julius expressed gratitude, stating that he was genuinely glad to have been raised by his grandfather. To him, the elder was the one and only family he cherished. Seated together, the grandfather acknowledged Julius's sentiments, affirming that Julius was indeed a grandchild he took immense pride in. With a sense of fulfillment, he departed from their shared space. Left in contemplation, Julius resolved to discover his true desires. Embracing his newfound identity as Julius von Carlyle, he recognized that this was his second chance at life. Determined to make the most of it, he pledged to try his best to savor every moment and find joy in the simple act of living. On the other side, Historia found herself in her father's house when he approached her with a message from the Duke of the Carlyle family. The message conveyed the Duke's intention to cancel the betrothal citing rumors of Historia's alleged intimacy with the second son of the family. Inquisitive, her father demanded an explanation, urging her to clarify the situation. In response, Historia assured her father that there was a valid reason behind her actions. Unyielding, her father dismissed her explanation, declaring that he would not entertain any excuses. He emphasized that an act of infidelity, especially by the daughter of a king, was deemed unforgivable in his eyes. Disturbed by the news, Historia's father insisted that he needed to confront Julius immediately and implore him to reconsider the decision to annul the betrothal. The unfolding drama underscored the complexities of noble relationships and the repercussions of rumors within aristocratic circles. He informed Historia that she was prohibited from entering the castle until the strained relationship had been mended. Overwhelmed by the severity of her father's decision, Historia hastily retreated from the scene, expressing her disbelief at the harshness of his actions. She pondered why she had to approach Julius to apologize and repair the relationship, finding the entire situation too cruel, even for her father. As she fled, Historia reflected on Julius's recent behavior, noting that just the day before, he seemed like an entirely different person. Perplexed by his sudden change, she described him as weird. In a moment of self-reflection, Historia questioned the accelerated beating of her own heart, admitting that she never considered someone like Julius as particularly special. Asserting her straightforward nature as a member of Gaia's family, she grappled with the unexpected turn of events and the emotions entangled within her tumultuous situation. Faced with the constraints imposed by her father, Historia found herself contemplating a rather unconventional solution. She acknowledged that, due to her father's actions, she felt compelled to resort to making Julius intoxicated and fostering a romantic encounter. In her mind, the plan seemed straightforward, to create a situation where Julius would express a desire to marry her. Carrying out her scheme, Historia then entered the classroom where Elise was present. Eager to locate Julius, she inquired about Elise's knowledge of his whereabouts. Elise, however, diverted the conversation, expressing confusion over a topic from the previous lesson and expressing her intent to self-study. The unfolding events hinted at Historia's strategic maneuvering and the intricate web of relationships within the noble class. In the classroom, Venom Zard unexpectedly took on the role of a teacher leaving the students pleasantly surprised and overjoyed to have her as their instructor. The atmosphere shifted as the students, captivated by her presence, expressed their admiration, with many expressing a desire to marry her. Venom Zard, recognizing the enthusiasm of the students, remarked on the school being an intriguing experience she had chosen to explore. The students, completely enamored by Venom Zard's beauty, vocalized their infatuation, asserting that her allure surpassed that of everyone else. 
Some even went so far as to express their willingness to break the law for a chance to be with her. The scene painted a vivid picture of the students' collective admiration and love for Venom Zard, creating a light-hearted yet slightly intense dynamic within the classroom. As the lunch break arrived, all the guys headed out for their meal. In an unexpected turn of events, Venom Zard approached Julius from behind and embraced him, expressing a hint of jealousy. Playfully, Julius commented on her seamless integration into the school environment, even donning a uniform that surprisingly suited a demon immortal. In the midst of their conversation, Elise joined them, expressing her desire to join in during lunchtime. This proposition led Venom Zard to ponder who these women were who seemed to be encroaching on her territory, creating a moment of amusing tension. The lunch break unfolded with a blend of unexpected camaraderie and subtle rivalry as the characters navigated the dynamics of their interactions within the school setting. Venom Zard mentioned that her master had prepared the bento earlier that morning, encouraging everyone to partake in the delightful meal. As Historia sat there, she pondered the sudden appearance of these fast-paced women, wondering where they had been all along. The group gathered in the cafeteria, enjoying the sandwiches laid out before them. When Venom Zard tasted the sandwich crafted by her master, she expressed her appreciation, asserting that the food prepared by her master surpassed the taste of her subordinates' meals, deeming them even worse than garbage in comparison. The lunchtime conversation unfolded, blending moments of humor and culinary critique among the characters. Elise praised the delightful taste of the sandwich, commending Venom Zard for her excellent culinary skills. Julius expressed some concern, but Elise suggested that had he revealed his ability to create such delicious dishes earlier, she would not have felt the need to challenge him. In response to the discussion about the sandwich's exceptional flavor, Venom Zard playfully inquired whether the sandwich possessed the power to quell the flames of war. The exchange showcased a blend of humor and culinary appreciation among the characters, as they enjoyed the unexpected culinary talents displayed in the midst of their conversations. Approaching Venom Zard, Elise recounted her recent thoughts, revealing that she had pondered whether Venom Zard truly was the demon immortal. In response, Venom Zard asserted her identity affirming that she could swiftly turn the entire gathering into a sea of blood if she desired. Julius swiftly intervened, urging her not to take such extreme measures. Acknowledging Venom Zard's past existence as a colossal dragon, Elise expressed awareness of her formidable history. Venom Zard, with a touch of humor, mused about her dragon form, suggesting that in that state, she probably would not have been able to enjoy the sandwich anyway. The exchange captured a mix of seriousness, camaraderie, and lighthearted banter among the characters. Elise turned to Julius, inquiring about his ability to summon such a formidable immortal. Julius modestly replied that he was neither less nor more than the summoner of such a being. Interested in their dynamic, Venom Zard asked Elise if she intended to investigate both of them. Elise dismissed the idea, stating she had no intention of delving into such matters. Elise clarified that Julius's identity did not concern her. The fact that he was an important friend was sufficient. Her perspective highlighted the significance of their friendship, setting aside any need for intricate investigations. The conversation unfolded with an emphasis on the bonds between the characters and the acceptance of each other's unique qualities. In a reflective moment, Julius realized he had never experienced friendship until now. Grateful, he expressed his thanks to Elise and expressed his hope that they would get along well in the future. Elise reciprocated with a positive affirmation, acknowledging her limited usefulness, but expressing a similar hope for good relations. Suddenly, a teacher entered the cafeteria, inquiring about Mr. Carlyle's presence. The teacher conveyed that the principal had summoned him and requested his immediate presence. The unexpected interruption shifted the atmosphere, leaving Julius and Elise to wonder about the reason for the principal's urgent call. Observing the situation, Julius scanned the surroundings, searching for Mr. Carlyle. Gaius, noticing the confusion, stood up and assured Julius that he would be joining them shortly. This revelation left Julius stunned, prompting him to inquire if Gaius was indeed Carlyle. In response, Gaius confirmed that if the name Carlyle was involved, it had to be him, and he needed to respond to the principal's summons. However, a teacher intervened, correcting Gaius by mentioning that the principal specifically called for Julius. Gaius, now in an angered tone, turned towards Julius, questioning how he could put him in such a shameful position. The unexpected twist in the principal's request led to a tense exchange, with Gaius expressing frustration at the mix-up caused by the shared surname. Upon realizing the misunderstanding, Julius promptly apologized to Gaius, acknowledging that it seemed the principal was specifically summoning him. Accompanying the teacher who had conveyed the message, Julius sought clarification, asking if he had done something wrong. The teacher, however, could not provide a reason for the principal's call. As they proceeded, Julius could not shake the peculiar sensation that the academy felt familiar, 
as if he had been there before. He reflected on this strange feeling, expressing to the teacher that the place seemed strangely familiar, evoking a sense of long-standing connection that he found difficult to explain. Upon arriving at the principal's office, the teacher directed Julius to proceed inside. Julius acknowledged with a simple, okay, and proceeded to knock on the office door. Identifying himself as Julius, he sought permission to enter, and a voice from within granted him access. As they entered the office, Julius's attention was drawn to a lizard, and he could not help but express his admiration for its cuteness. The principal, noticing Julius's reaction, queried whether the lizard piqued his interest. Julius responded by sharing his internal appreciation for the adorable lizard, and the lady teacher accompanying him echoed the sentiment, remarking on the creature's undeniable cuteness. The unexpected focus on the lizard added a light and amusing touch to the atmosphere in the principal's office. The principal chuckled at the idea of calling the lizard cute, finding it quite amusing. He went on to provide additional details, explaining that the creature was known as the Green Dragon, considered one of the rarest dragon specimens. Describing its imposing features, he highlighted its thick and durable scales, along with sharp, pointy claws and fangs. Characterizing it as a heinous monster capable of fiercely spitting out flames from its mouth, he continued, noting that the sight of its ominous power often sent shivers down people's spines. The principal reflected on the humorous contrast between the dragon's fearsome reputation and the seemingly contradictory notion of describing it as cute. The lizard turned out to be quite sizable, prompting Julius to casually remark that such lizards were common and could be found running around everywhere. In response, the principal, Isares von Einworth, introduced himself and expressed apologies for the sudden summons. Julius, realizing Isares was the academy's principal, wondered if he had done something to warrant a visit to the principal's office. Isares then playfully challenged Julius to guess why he had been called there. Perplexed, Julius admitted he could not think of any reason, emphasizing that he tried to lead a quiet and earnest life. The exchange between Julius and Principal Isares unfolded with a mix of curiosity and uncertainty about the purpose of the unexpected meeting. Isares produced a stone and inquired if Julius remembered it from somewhere. Julius recognized it as a fragment of something, and Isares confirmed that it was part of a machine used to measure magic. Julius jokingly asked if he had broken one of the school's pieces of equipment into fragments. The teacher, overhearing the conversation, questioned whether Julius was planning to venture into the academy's underground labyrinth alone. Julius, later joining Venom and Elise in the classroom, informed them that it was an order from the principal to measure his power. He humorously added that he had indeed broken the power measuring machine. The exchange highlighted the lighthearted banter and the unexpected turn of events surrounding the broken equipment and the subsequent order from the principal. Elise expressed disbelief, stating that it could not be happening. She added that Julius should be aware of the nature of the underground labyrinth. Gaius arrived and chastised Julius, remarking that he was as foolish and ignorant as ever. Gaius went on to describe the labyrinth, explaining that it sprawled throughout the underground of the academy, serving as a cave inhabited by hundreds and thousands of magical beasts. He emphasized that the labyrinth had been sealed and strictly prohibited from entry, given that no explorer had ever returned alive. It was considered a highly forbidden place due to the inherent dangers associated with it. Gaius continued, remarking on the principal's personality. He emphasized that venturing into such a place was equivalent to receiving a death sentence. Gaius expressed confusion about why or how Julius had angered the principal, but urged him to swiftly go and prostrate himself on the ground, pleading for forgiveness while he still had the chance. In response, Julius acknowledged his understanding and suggested that he should probably proceed. Gaius, surprised, questioned whether Julius had even been listening to his advice. Julius proceeded to the location Isares had indicated, finding himself standing before what appeared to be the entrance to the Academy's underground labyrinth. Contemplating the situation, he recalled Gaius expressing a lack of concern for Julius's fate within the labyrinth, even going so far as to include the possibility of death. Julius could not help but think of Gaius as an overly nonchalant older brother. As he observed his surroundings, Julius noticed the arrival of Venom Zard, a demon in a diminutive form. She remarked on the peculiarity of a person like him venturing into the underground labyrinth, questioning Isarez's motives in the process. Responding to Julius's apparent solo mission, Venom Zard insisted that, as a demon, she could not abandon her master. Julius, somewhat surprised by her presence, casually suggested that she did not need to accompany him. In response, Venom Zard affirmed her commitment to staying by his side, emphasizing her duty as a demon not to leave her master alone. Despite Julius's attempt to downplay the situation, Venom Zard remained steadfast in her loyalty. Continuing with her assurance, Venom Zard expressed to Julius that he need not worry about her hindering his progress. She earnestly asked for forgiveness on this occasion. Julius, acknowledging her presence, 
remarked that perhaps the Academy's principal could tolerate someone he could converse with. Articulating his objective, Julius shared that his destination lay within the deepest part of the labyrinth, where he aimed to collect various items. With determination, he entered the labyrinth, considering the quest ahead as a welcome change after a prolonged period of inactivity. Venom Zard expressed her happiness in witnessing her master enjoy himself, finding joy in his amusement. As Julius ventured further into the labyrinth, a group of goblins appeared. Without hesitation, Julius instructed them to attack, confidently asserting that he could defeat them effortlessly. Surprisingly, the goblins retreated abruptly, leaving Julius puzzled about their sudden departure. Perplexed by the goblins' unexpected fear, Julius remarked that he had not even taken any action, yet they dispersed on their own. Venom Zard chimed in explaining that the mere presence of Julius's aura and his evident determination to eliminate them frightened the low-level beasts. She noted that this was a testament to the strength of a true hero, making it unnecessary for him to engage with weaker opponents. Despite the apparent advantage, Julius could not shake off an uneasy feeling, sensing a foreboding premonition from the situation. On Julius's journey, various adversaries crossed his path, yet none proved successful in bringing about his demise. Initially, a headless knight with a level 50 ranking attempted to strike him down with its sword. However, the sword shattered upon impact, and the knight swiftly retreated from the encounter. Following this, a group of formidable opponents emerged, including level 70 golems, a level 80 gargoyle, a level 99 boss troll, a level 75 rock, and a level 90 harpy queen. Despite their formidable levels, each opponent made only a singular attempt to confront Julius before deciding to withdraw. The reason for their retreat became evident. Julius's strength proved insurmountable for these powerful adversaries, prompting them to reconsider engaging further. After the lackluster encounters with the adversaries, Julius expressed his dissatisfaction, deeming the encounters as dull. In response, Venom Zard advised him against voicing such sentiments. Julius, reflecting on the low level of the opponents, remarked that he had not even engaged in a proper fight. Venom Zard explained that the perceived weakness of the beasts was due to Julius's overwhelming strength. She added that their confusion and ineffectiveness were also a result of her absence, suggesting that her presence usually guided the demon and the beasts in harnessing the released power of the immortal demon to enhance their capabilities. Puzzled, Julius sought clarification on what she meant by at a loss. Venom Zard elaborated, revealing that initially, the demon and the beasts utilized the demon immortal's released power to augment their own strength. The absence of this guidance left them struggling to cope and adapt, hence the apparent confusion and vulnerability in their encounters with Julius. Venomzard continued, revealing that after her demise, the demons and beasts experienced a continuous decline over 200 years. She explained that even the humans who managed to defeat these weakened creatures also began to lose their strength. Now, after two centuries, Julius could witness the repercussions of this weakening phenomenon. Addressing the sudden change in direction, Venomzard directed Julius to turn to his right where a staircase awaited. Intrigued, Julius questioned how she possessed knowledge of the labyrinth's layout and the surroundings. Venomzard, with a hint of surprise, asked if he had not realized it yet. She disclosed that both the labyrinth and the academy were, in fact, the castle of the demon immortal. Julius stood in astonishment, as Venomzard disclosed the surprising revelation that the academy had repurposed the demon immortal's castle for its own use. Perplexed, Julius inquired about the reasons behind this unexpected development. Venom Zard, in response to his question, admitted that she could not fathom the motivations behind the Academy's decision. She emphasized that two centuries had passed since her demise, making it challenging for her to comprehend the current intentions of humans. Despite the uncertainty surrounding the Academy's actions, Venom Zard expressed her familiarity with the labyrinth, likening it to Julius's personal playground. With a note of caution, she pointed out the presence of a trap in the immediate vicinity. Expressing gratitude, Julius thanked Venom Zard for guiding him through the labyrinth acknowledging that he had successfully reached their destination without getting lost. In response, Venomzard remarked that he could thank her as much as he liked, highlighting her role in their journey. Upon reaching a room with a centrally positioned stone, Julius inquired about the significance of the room and the stone. Venomzard explained that the aesthetically pleasing stone was known as a float. Intrigued, Julius suggested taking the stone as a souvenir, a sentiment echoed by Venomzard, who agreed it would be a nice memento to bring back home. As Julius picked up the stone, he hesitated, questioning if he had made a mistake once again. The uncertainty lingered in the air as he sought reassurance from Venom Zard. In the principal's office, a group of individuals arrived, expressing their dissatisfaction with Iserez's actions. One person forcefully pounded the table, questioning Iserez about the decision to unseal a perilous underground threat. 
Accusing him of inhumanity for allowing a student to face such danger, they demanded an explanation. Remaining calm, Isares was asked to clarify his motives. In response, he presented a stone, placing it in front of the concerned group. He urged them to closely inspect the object. Perplexed, the individuals questioned the nature of the item. Isares revealed that it was a fragment of the magical cave line, a substance believed to be indestructible by the magical powers of the world's inhabitants. Continuing, Isares explained that the stone was what Julius had attempted to destroy, an action that might have been a mistake or a failure. He proposed the question of whether they would like to verify the truth of this matter. Isares elaborated, revealing that he had sent Julius into the labyrinth, a place from which no one had ever returned unharmed. As the tension in the room escalated, a magic circle suddenly materialized, startling everyone present. Recognizing the immense power emanating from the magical circle, they were compelled to leave the area. To their surprise, Julius emerged from the magic circle, catching them off guard. A sense of astonishment overcame the onlookers as they witnessed Julius's sudden appearance. In response to Julius's inquiry about the individuals present, Venom Zard jokingly questioned if it was some kind of festival. One of the individuals, offended, insisted they should not be referred to as old, emphasizing that Julius had seemingly materialized out of nowhere. Recognizing the magical phenomenon, Julius casually remarked that it was simply transfer magic. The individuals, still bewildered, expressed shock at the revelation. They explained that transfer magic, particularly the spatial transference aspect, was considered a lost and ancient secret, making Julius's arrival a perplexing and unexpected event. Julius explained that he employed transfer magic because he did not want to retrace his steps. In response, the individuals cautioned that users of transference magic should not excessively use it in that world. Julius, maintaining his casual demeanor, remarked that magic could be useful, especially for late-night bathroom visits. Isarez then inquired about the item Julius had been seeking. Julius confirmed the validity of his quest, prompting laughter from the group. They teasingly pointed out a seemingly incongruous detail, referring to it as a hand-wringing blasphemy. Additionally, they expressed annoyance with the Waystone theory, emphasizing the impracticality of transporting a row of wise men back home with them. Curious about the stone, Julius inquired, and Venom Zard quickly affirmed, recognizing it as the one. Julius speculated that perhaps she had picked it up on the way to his room. Subsequently, Julius produced the stone, unveiling it to everyone present. Their reaction was one of shock and realization. They identified it as a tearful magical dust bowl, acknowledging its true nature as a genuine succession of wise men. The revelation left them in awe of the unexpected and profound nature of the discovered item. They expressed concern that the philosopher's stone should have been guarded by the immortal beasts. Wondering how he managed to obtain it, Julius explained that something unusual occurred when he picked up the stone. The individuals elaborated, stating that their ancestors had placed the three-headed immortal of beasts as a protector to safeguard the philosopher's stone. They emphasized that if the guardian had been present, he would not have emerged unscathed. Perplexed, Julius sought clarification, asking if they were referring to those dogs. Julius continued, mentioning that the immortal beasts had approached him, rolling over and showing their bellies, seemingly desiring affection. This gesture led to the individuals expressing anger, claiming that he had successfully tamed the immortal beasts. Julius explained that he found them cute and wanted to keep them. But the demon immortal opposed the idea. Venom Zard chimed in, stating that caring for and raising living beings was quite challenging, citing the inconvenience of walks and other responsibilities. Julius reflected on the situation, realizing that the conversation had inadvertently portrayed the immortal beasts as if they were his pets. Julius acknowledged the situation, admitting to feeling a bit uneasy because there was only the dog and the stone present. Venom Zard affirmed his sentiments. Subsequently, Julius recounted how he discovered a suspicious wall, prompting him to break through it and unveil a secret room. The individuals were astonished, noting that the wall surrounding the room containing the Philosopher's Stone was constructed from orichalcum, the world's strongest mineral. They inquired about the method he used to break through such formidable material. In response, Julius nonchalantly explained that he simply sliced through it with a sword, employing his usual technique. A sense of astonishment swept over the group, and Julius proceeded to describe his next actions. He entered the room, revealing an array of treasures within. However, Faced with a multitude of choices, he found it challenging to decide. Ultimately, he opted to utilize a magical technique called Gate Different Space, storing the treasures in an alternate dimension. Curious about this magical storage, the group sought clarification. Julius explained that Gate Different Spaces belonged to a category of next dimension magic. When activated, this magic summoned a distinct space from the fourth dimension, allowing for the storage of various items. 
Venom Zard suggested to Julius that it would be quicker to show rather than explain, and he concurred, acknowledging her point. Julius then concluded that he had taken all the items from the secret room. Upon inspecting the loot, the group identified an infinite magic crystal named Infinity Citrin and a mythical class treasure, the Levitan Sword. They urged Julius not to reveal that these items were, in fact, a collection of SSS-ranked treasures amassed together. Julius, seemingly unfazed, questioned the rarity of such items, asserting that everything they found was common 2,000 years ago. He continued, expressing his confusion about what surprised the older individuals. In response, they insisted on enlightening him about the significance of the items they discovered. After the departure of the others, Isarez sported a satisfied smile. Julius found himself seated at the cafeteria with Elise, presenting her with a letter. Observing its contents, Elise expressed her astonishment, deeming it incredible that he had not only returned unscathed from the underground labyrinth, but had also unintentionally acquired a rare item. In addition, she revealed that he had been honored with the position of the Academy's scholarship student. Responding casually, Julius questioned the significance of becoming a scholarship student. Elise, however, emphasized that it was beyond mere amazement. It was something truly extraordinary. Elise continued to elaborate, explaining that as a scholarship student, Julius would be exempt from paying school fees and participating in classes and tests. Furthermore, scholarship students received various privileges, making them exceptionally special. Elise noted that these positions were typically awarded once a year, exclusively to those who excelled academically, and it was unusual for someone to be recognized mid-term. Venom Zard chimed in, expressing admiration for her master and toasting to the moment with tea. Julius, observing Elise's enjoyment, commented on the changes in both humans and demons over the past 2,000 years, noting that proficiency in things other than combat had diminished. Venom Zard remarked on the noticeable improvement in their cooking skills, expressing satisfaction with the progress. Elise observed a positive change in Julius's behavior, noting that in the past, he used to pay little attention to anything and consistently ignored those who tried to engage with him. Julius turned his gaze towards Venom Zard and shared his thoughts. He recalled a conversation with Elise about Julius before his reincarnation, noting that his memories as a hero were incomplete, causing his soul to wander in a void-like state. Elise speculated that this incomplete state might have contributed to Julius's appearance of fatigue and lethargicness to those around him. While resting on the chair, Julius pondered the nature of Julius's personality before reincarnation, wondering what kind of person he used to be. Recognizing the time gap of 2,000 years, he reasoned that dwelling on the past might be futile. As he reclined, Julius's thoughts drifted to his own previous life, envisioning himself with a sword, walking through a devastated town, and finding moments of repose. Comparing this past life to his present existence, he contemplated the significant differences between the two. Julius reflected on his tranquil present life, sipping tea while seated alongside Elise and Venom Zard. As he observed pigeons gracefully flying and people strolling by, he remarked on the universal sight of smiling faces and the absence of weapons in their hands. Julius appreciated the simple joy of peace prevailing in their surroundings. In response to his musings, Elise questioned the uniqueness of their location, asserting that it was not any different from other places. Julius agreed, but clarified that his contemplation centered on the whereabouts of a specific group, the demons. He pondered where they might have disappeared in the midst of this peaceful scene. Elise informed Julius that the hero's immortality had long ago eradicated the demons, a historical fact learned in their history class. She playfully remarked on his eccentric nature, emphasizing that he stood out as an oddball. Julius acknowledged the era's peaceful nature, appreciating the lasting tranquility. Shortly after, Julius's younger brother approached, acknowledging the news of his elder brother achieving the coveted scholarship. Holding a wrapped item, the younger brother expressed his eagerness for the achievement Julius had apparently sought after. In response, Julius humbly stated that he did not particularly desire the scholarship and suggested that his brother could pursue it if he truly coveted it, offering to give it up for him. Gaius retorted, expressing frustration at being consistently underestimated. He declared that he would no longer forgive such behavior. With determination, he unveiled a wrapped item, revealing a surprising sight that left the two girls astounded. What lay before them was no ordinary object. It was a sword, a legendary one that should have been securely preserved within the confines of a museum. Gaius proceeded to unsheath the legendary sword, prompting a concerned response from Elise, who advised against engaging in a battle with his older brother. She emphasized the inappropriateness of bringing forth such a significant weapon for a familial conflict. Ignoring her advice, Gaius dismissed Elise as an outsider, insisting that she refrain from interfering. Addressing his older brother, 
Gaius challenged Julius to a duel for the right to claim the scholarship student title. He asserted that if victorious, he would assume the privileges associated with the scholarship. Julius reiterated his previous statement, affirming that even without a fight, he intended to willingly hand over the scholarship to Gaius. This declaration only fueled Gaius's anger, leading him to accuse Julius of consistently making a fool out of him. Determined to settle the matter through combat, Gaius prepared himself for the impending duel. As Gaius swung the enchanted sword toward Julius, the latter skillfully evaded the attack, showcasing agility that left Elise impressed. Gaius explained that the sword was imbued with lightning magic, enhancing his speed to match that of lightning itself, an incredible velocity beyond the capacity of human eyes, even for brothers. Gaius swiftly wielded the enchanted sword in an attempt to strike Julius with remarkable speed. He pointed out the contrast between their abilities and challenged Julius to catch him, emphasizing the distinct difference in their skill sets. As Gaius attempted another swift strike with the enchanted sword, Julius surprised everyone by effortlessly halting the blade with just two fingers. Both Elise and Gaius were left in awe at this unexpected feat. Julius calmly explained that this was his method of stopping Gaius, acknowledging that Gaius had indeed become a bit faster. Puzzled, Gaius questioned why the sword remained motionless, seemingly at peace between Julius's fingers. Julius playfully remarked that with sufficient training, he could catch the sword even at lightning speed. However, their interaction was interrupted by a newcomer, who informed Gaius that he had been discovered, questioning how he could attempt to steal a sword from the museum. Elise quickly identified the approaching man as one of the clerks, explaining there was a valid explanation for his presence. The clerk dismissed any need for explanations and summoned Gaius over. Julius advised Gaius to stay calm for a moment. The clerk, upon seeing Julius, was visibly surprised, and acknowledged him as the scholarship student. Expressing confusion, he wondered why Julius had not disclosed his status earlier. The clerk then informed Julius that scholarship students had the privilege to freely acquire and use items outside of museums for experimental purposes, dispelling any concerns about the sword. The clerk reassured Julius that there was no issue if it was related to his status as a scholarship student, and then departed. Seizing the opportunity, Julius remarked to Gaius that the incident of attempted theft had been overlooked, thanks to the scholarship status. Gaius, however, expressed a strong dislike for that aspect of his brother. Trying to lighten the mood, Julius suggested they enjoy some cakes, to which Venom Zard commented on their unbreakable brotherly bond, bringing a smile to her face. Meanwhile, at the Izarez office, he summoned some individuals, and upon their arrival they inquired if he had called them. Izarez, contemplating the recent events, stated that it seemed the prophecy had proven true after all. The individuals assembled by Izarez remarked that the moment had arrived for the cause of the calamity to unfold noting that it aligned perfectly with the prophecy. Iserez affirmed their observation, agreeing that the time had come for the demons, once oppressed, to make their presence known to the world once again. Identifying himself as the reborn immortal of heroes, Iserez asserted that the present was the opportune moment for him and his scattered brethren to step into the limelight. In response to the unfolding events, Julius recognized the urgency of the situation, feeling the need to rise to the occasion. Eugene who faced near death in a harrowing battle against the demon immortal, found himself reincarnated 2,000 years later. Thanks to the demonic ability he acquired, he embarked on his second life. As the narrative unfolded, he was reunited with his late grandpa, now wielded strength surpassing even his prime, compelling the once dominant demon immortal to submit to him, the hero. Returning to his new life, Eugene casually strolled into the dining area at home. The servant girls warmly greeted him, extending a welcome, and informed him that dinner was ready to be served. Responding with a grin, Julius expresses his hunger, eager to partake in the upcoming meal. As Julius approached the dining table, he noticed the familiar faces of his mother, father, and younger brother already seated. His father, acknowledging Gaius, remarked that unlike someone lacking in skills, Gaius was exceptionally talented. Julius observed that the family had begun eating even before his arrival, and could not help but notice the absence of a chair for him. Julius introduced his parents sharing that he had reincarnated as Julius, but had not fully integrated for the past 15 years. Only recently had he become fully conscious as a hero. Despite the warmth of his mother's praise for Gaius, Julius could not shake the feeling that his family had commenced their meal without him, leaving him without a place to sit. Reflecting on the dynamics within the family, Julius acknowledged his role in shaping their perception of him. He recognized that his 15 years of idleness contributed to the attitudes directed his way. Sharing his thoughts, he pointed out the intriguing coexistence of the exceptionally talented Gaius and the seemingly inept Julius under the same roof. Despite this, he felt a sense of determination to change the narrative and pull himself together. 
Taking charge of the situation, Julius decided to claim a seat at the dining table. He grabbed a chair, positioned it for himself, and sat down. Curious about the ongoing conversation, he casually inquired with his parents about the topic at hand. His father, somewhat surprised by his sudden assertiveness, questioned why he was sitting on the side. Undeterred, Julius seized the moment to emphasize the importance of family unity. He reminded his parents that they should all dine together as a family. Expressing the belief that it was normal for a family to share a meal while engaging in conversation, he urged them to join him at the table. Julius aimed to foster a sense of togetherness, emphasizing the significance of familial bonds during dinner time. In response to his father's harsh comment, Julius could not help but feel the sting despite the fact that his grandfather, not related by blood, had treated him with kindness. Nevertheless, he maintained his composure in the face of the unexpected criticism. Shifting the tone, his father then turned his attention to Gaius, expressing immense joy upon hearing news from the academy. He proudly declared Gaius as their true son, celebrating his achievement as a scholarship student at the Royal Academy. This revelation left Julius in a state of shock, his expectations shattered by the unexpected turn of events. Undeterred, his father continued, expressing unwavering confidence that Gaius was the prophesied child destined to lead their family to victory. Overflowing with excitement for Gaius's future, his father envisioned great success and accomplishment. However, Gaius, equally stunned, refuted the claim, asserting that he was not a scholarship student. This revelation left both his father and mother in a state of disbelief. His father, insistent and bewildered, swore that he had heard news specifically about a child from the Carlyle family, securing a scholarship. The confusion in the room intensified as they grappled with the disparity between the perceived reality and the unfolding truth. In the midst of the family's discussion, a lady servant entered and informed Mr. Carlyle, Julius's father, that a letter had arrived from the academy. Seizing the moment, Mr. Carlyle took hold of the letter and directed Gaius to inspect its contents, highlighting its significance as proof of the scholarship student. Noticing the letter, Julius suggested that it probably belonged to him. In response, Mr. Carlyle questioned Julius about his claim. Undeterred, Julius confidently asserted that he was the scholarship student in question. This declaration triggered Mr. Carlyle's anger, leading him to dismiss Julius's statement as mere rubbish. According to Mr. Carlyle, given Julius's consistently poor grades, the idea of him earning a scholarship seemed implausible. Julius's mother interjected, expressing disbelief that Julius had no knowledge of the scholarship student matter. She clarified that only a few exceptional students could qualify for the scholarship, emphasizing that Julius could not possibly be one of them. However, when they opened the letter, both she and Mr. Carlyle were taken aback, realizing there had been a mistake in assuming Julius was the scholarship student. Witnessing the shocking revelation in the letter, Gaius decided to leave the room. Julius, noticing Gaius's departure, called out to him, asking if he did not want to join them for the meal. Ignoring the invitation, Gaius continued to his bedroom, leaving Julius puzzled by the unexpected turn of events. In the stillness of the night, Gaius sat on his bed, grappling with the gravity of being a scholarship student. He felt a profound sadness, deeply contemplating the implications of this new reality. As he delved into his memories, Gaius reflected on Julius's recent transformation, how within just a few days, Julius had morphed into someone remarkably talented and powerful, almost like an entirely different person. Turning the pages of his childhood, Gaius recalled that Julius had always been an oddball from birth, aloof, silent, and lethargic. Those around him had often labeled him as incapable of achieving anything in life. Recognizing this, their parents swiftly came to the conclusion that Julius was a lost cause, leading them to give up on him. Gaius recounted a poignant moment from his early years when his father, acknowledging Julius's perceived shortcomings, expressed to Gaius that he could not become as powerful as his brother. Instead, Gaius was designated to bear the weight of expectations as the son of the Duke's family. Despite these challenging circumstances, Gaius harbored no resentment toward his older brother. On the contrary, he assured Julius that he would step into his shoes and become someone special. Gaius envisioned a future where he would assert authority and order determined to carve out his own unique path in Julius's stead. Gaius expressed his resolve to stand up for Julius, vowing to discourage others from making fun of him. Reflecting on their shared past, Gaius recalled the times when Julius, despite being younger, played alongside him. He recounted how Julius provided comfort during challenging training sessions, offering solace when tears were shed, and sharing the warmth of companionship on lonely nights. Gaius affirmed that his love for Julius stemmed from these simple yet meaningful gestures. However, Gaius transitioned to a somber memory from their shared childhood. He recounted a winter day when he was five years old, and the family set out for a mountain villa, 
Even though the escort assured them that no monsters would appear, they let their guards down. It was during this moment of vulnerability that they unexpectedly faced an attack from a bear-like monster. Seated there, both Gaia's and Julius gazed at the menacing bear-like monster surrounded by lifeless guards. In the face of this perilous situation, Gaius turned to Julius, seeking guidance on what to do next. The monstrous bear roared, and Gaius braced himself for the seemingly inevitable. Unexpectedly, Julius took swift action, leaping onto the monster bear and swiftly severing its head with his bare hands. The colossal creature crumpled to the ground, lifeless. Overwhelmed by the sudden turn of events, Gaius, in a panicked manner, questioned Julius about the incredible feat. In response to Gaius's inquiry, Julius, seemingly unfazed, asked if Gaius had sustained any injuries. Gaius, at that moment, saw in Julius a figure straight out of the fairy tales he so admired, an immortal hero. The astonishing display of courage and strength left Gaius in awe of his brother's newfound capabilities. Continuing the narrative, Gaius recalled the aftermath of Julius's valiant act against the monstrous bear. Despite Julius's victory, he unexpectedly collapsed, and to Gaius's dismay, the onlookers credited him with defeating the creature. The pervasive belief that Julius remained incapable of achieving anything echoed through the crowd. Amidst the misperceptions, Gaius found solace in being the sole keeper of Julius's true identity, the fact that Julius had been hiding his genuine powers from the world. Amidst his contemplation, a knock resonated on Gaius's room door. It was Julius inquiring about Gaius's wakefulness. Questioning Julius's purpose, Gaius sought to understand his intentions. In response, Julius shared that he had noticed Gaius had not eaten much during dinner. With genuine care, Julius had prepared a heartfelt and specially crafted meal, something super-duper special, expressively for Gaius, inviting him to enjoy the dish made with love and dedication. In response to Julius's gesture of preparing a special meal, Gaius firmly declined, expressing his disinterest in such seemingly pointless efforts. Undeterred, Julius insisted that he had already made it with care for Gaius. Curious about why Julius persistently bothered him, Gaius questioned his older brother's motivations. Julius's simple yet profound response was that it was because he was Gaius's little brother. Reflecting on his own journey, Gaius admitted that despite his training, he never felt equal to the hidden powers Julius had revealed that day. Despite his efforts, others continued to dismiss his abilities. Gaius speculated that Julius might have concealed his powers to avoid becoming the head of the house, and this thought fueled a simmering anger within him. Continuing his contemplation, Gaius expressed his frustration at Julius's sudden display of powers, labeling it as foolish and leading to him becoming a scholarship student. The brother who once cared for him, the one who feigned powerlessness, and the one who stood unmatched by others. Gaius grappled with the question of which version of Julius was the real him. Addressing Julius directly, Gaius accused him of deceiving everyone by pretending to be powerless and weak. Confused by Gaius's accusations, Julius sought clarification, expressing his lack of understanding. Unmoved, Gaius straightforwardly declared his strong resentment, stating that he hated Julius for the deception and the confusion surrounding his true nature. Following Julius's gesture of leaving the meal behind, he instructed Gaius to consume it before it cooled. After Julius departed, Gaius exited the room and discovered the awaiting food. Assessing the dish, he expressed his dissatisfaction, questioning how Julius could label it as a super-duper special meal. Gaius, now standing before the unappetizing meal, pondered the disparity between Julius's description and the reality of the food. He wondered about Julius's intentions and the reasons behind presenting such a meal. The conflicting emotions stirred within Gaius as he contemplated the unexpected turn of events. Julius observed as Gaius hesitated before picking up the spoon, obediently following his older brother's suggestion to try the unfamiliar dish. Slowly he filled the spoon with the questionable food and cautiously brought it to his mouth. However, the taste turned out to be less than pleasant causing Gaius to spit it out immediately, forcefully throwing the tray cover aside. Overwhelmed by the unpleasant experience, Gaius could not hold back his tears. Witnessing his younger brother's distress, Venom Zard emerged from the scene and noticed Gaius in the midst of his emotional moment. Concerned, she approached Julius, who had been quietly observing from the background and informed him about Gaius's tears. It became evident that the food, which had initially seemed promising, had not met Gaius's taste expectations leading to a memorable and emotional incident that unfolded in the presence of the three characters. Venom Zard inquired of Julius, questioning whether he had added anything unusual to the omelette rice that caused Gaius's unpleasant reaction. In response, Julius shared a cryptic promise, expressing his intention to reveal the mystery someday. For the time being, he encouraged a gradual healing of their family bonds, emphasizing that the hidden essence within the dish was nothing but love. 
Later, as Julius prepared to depart in his conveyance, Venom Zard sought more information about their destination. Curious, she asked Julius where the carriage was headed. Julius disclosed that an important soiree was taking place at the king's castle, and it was mandatory for all noble families to attend. He further explained that he had been selected as the representative of the Carlisle household for this grand occasion, signaling an imminent journey to the royal domain. Julius acknowledged the presence of life's inevitable obstacles, understanding that deterrence were a part of the journey. Abruptly, he stepped out of the conveyance, his eyes scanning the surroundings. Venom Zard, sensing his alertness, questioned him about the unfolding events and the reason for his vigilant gaze. In response, Julius disclosed that an incident of attack was in progress. Reacting swiftly, Venom Zard activated her formidable evil eye power, capable of perceiving events occurring thousands of miles away. Gazing into the distance, she confirmed Julius's observation, noting that indeed, another area was also under assault. The duo found themselves drawn into a situation that demanded their attention and intervention. Acknowledging Julius's accuracy, Venom Zard inquired about his ability to detect hostile intent from a considerable distance. Julius, in response, explained that such sensitivities become ingrained over time, especially when one has served as a hero for an extended period. It's an inherent part of the experience, even if one may not actively seek it. In reply, Venom Zard noted that such a skill seemed to be a product of Julius's professional background. She recognized it as something acquired through his job, highlighting the unique set of senses and instincts developed during his tenure as a hero. Their conversation unveiled the intricacies of their individual experiences and the expertise gained from their respective roles. Venom Zard inquired about Julius's plan of action in response to the unfolding situation. Meanwhile, near the conveyance under attack, a man warned the occupants that their lives were at stake and urged them to reveal themselves. He pointed out that they were surrounded by a considerable number of people and suggested the idea of escaping. Suddenly the attention of everyone present shifted as a figure descended from the sky. It was Julius. The onlookers were astonished, expressing disbelief at witnessing a magical feat that allowed someone to soar through the air. Bewildered, they questioned the identity of the mysterious newcomer. In response to the inquiries, Julius calmly addressed the group identifying them as a band of bandits. He proposed a peaceful resolution, stating that he would spare them if they chose to return home without further resistance. Julius's unexpected entrance added a layer of intrigue to the encounter, setting the stage for a potential resolution to the confrontation. A man boldly stepped forward, brandishing a dagger and declaring his intention to use his super-duper special weapon to eliminate Julius. However, Julius swiftly disarmed him, breaking the dagger and securing its sharp edge in his hand. The would-be assailant was left in disbelief, expressing shock at the sudden turn of events. He revealed that the dagger was poisoned, prompting Julius to calmly explain that he had neutralized the threat by activating a magic barrier outside. This barrier, Julius clarified, was designed to deflect various forms of danger and abnormalities. Venom Zard chimed in, stating that maintaining such a magical barrier was a fundamental precautionary measure when venturing outside. The exchange highlighted the protagonist's expertise in handling potential dangers and showcased the importance of being prepared for unexpected challenges during their travels. Julius remarked that individuals from that era lacked caution. Perplexed, the others questioned his statement. Subsequently, another man stepped forward wielding a sword and declared his intent to eliminate Julius. He questioned Julius's martial prowess, suggesting that he stood no chance against a group of 30 people. The challenge posed a potential threat, and Julius found himself facing skepticism about his abilities. The unfolding situation hinted at a test of skills and strength between Julius and the approaching adversary. Suddenly, Julius activated his magical ability known as Shadow Clone. He generated an abundance of Shadow Clones, and these duplicates swiftly incapacitated the assailants with their hands. The defeated individuals fell to the ground, bewildered by the unexpected turn of events. One of them inquired about Julius's actions, questioning how he could perform such feats. In response, Julius calmly explained that the technique was a magical skill achieved by concentrating all of one's aura to create a clone, while maintaining the integrity of the original body. He emphasized that even a child could master this particular magic skill. The revelation shed light on the simplicity of the technique, and highlighted the versatility of magical abilities in the world they inhabited. The questioning man expressed amazement at Julius's abilities to defend against poison and create clones, wondering aloud about the nature of Julius's existence. Subsequently, the man called for his teacher, and declared that it was now the teacher's turn to intervene. The teacher arrived, and observing the situation, remarked to his soldiers that despite having numerous men on their side, they were unable to defeat a single youngster. While casually eating some meat, 
the teacher expressed disbelief that someone of his mighty stature had to personally emerge from his dwelling. He found it unbelievable that such circumstances required his direct involvement. The teacher's nonchalant demeanor added an element of irony to the situation as he contemplated the unexpected challenge presented by a seemingly formidable opponent. Julius inquired if the man was part of the demon bloodline. In response, the soldier clarified that Julius was referring to those who had been slain by a hero 2,000 years ago. The teacher, addressing Julius, remarked that he was quite an audacious young person. Confused, the soldier sought clarification on the teacher's statement. Julius pointed out that if someone constantly emitted such potent magical power, it would undoubtedly attract attention. The teacher found Julius's observation interesting. Subsequently, the teacher transformed into a colossal monster, warning Julius that anyone who witnessed him in this form never returned home. He challenged Julius, asking if he had the courage to face him. In response, Julius confidently asserted that the teacher should be directing that question to himself, setting the stage for a formidable confrontation between the two powerful beings. Julius explained that demons were a species fueled by negativity, inherently hostile toward humans due to their destructive tendencies and affinity for slaughter. He elaborated on the era of darkness when their overwhelming power struck terror into the hearts of people. However, with the heroic triumph of Eugene over the immortal demon, their once formidable strength rapidly diminished. Julius emphasized that demons, once a significant threat, had faded from memory and were assumed to have disappeared. The soldier, processing this revelation, expressed disbelief at the notion that the true identity of their supposed bodyguard was a frightening demon. The revelation seemed beyond comprehension, highlighting the drastic shift from the era of darkness to the current era of forgetfulness regarding the once-dreaded demonic threat. The gorilla remarked to Julius that he appeared so frightened that he could not find the words to speak. In response, Julius conveyed that despite widespread beliefs of the demon species' demise, they still persisted, specifically in the form of demon immortals. Venom Zard chimed in, pointing out that it seemed Julius had not kept up with the latest news regarding the existence of demons. Julius then inquired from the gorilla if there were any other demons besides him. He clarified that the gorilla, being a lower-class demon, might not have valuable information to share. The conversation unveiled a sense of tension and curiosity as the characters navigated the revelation of the continued existence of demons, particularly the powerful demon immortals. The soldier expressed concern, urging Julius to run away, labeling the situation as crazy. Dismissing the fear, Julius assured them that the gorilla was just an ordinary one and there was no need for panic. However, the gorilla, angered by Julius's words, vowed to kill him. In a sudden burst of action, the gorilla leaped at Julius, delivering a powerful punch that caused a significant blast, leaving the onlookers stunned. Unfazed, the gorilla declared that all of Julius's bravado had amounted to nothing. He taunted Julius, stating that despite the bravado, he had now been defeated. However, to everyone's surprise, Julius casually blocked the gorilla's massive punch with just one hand, standing relaxed. Julius remarked that the punch was boring, criticizing the lack of magic power assimilation in the attack. He pointed out the dullness of the gorilla's strategy, questioning the effectiveness of a punch devoid of magical enhancement. The unexpected turn of events showcased Julius's prowess and left the gorilla baffled by the unsuccessful assault. The onlookers were astounded by the display of power with the soldier expressing amazement at the kid's strength. He marveled at Julius's ability to effortlessly halt a fist capable of breaking bedrock with just one hand. Even the gorilla, stunned by the unexpected turn of events, questioned Julius about his feet. In response, Julius calmly explained that he possessed an armor of magical power, emphasizing that experts always equipped themselves with such protective enchantments. He added that even with intense concentration, the gorilla would not be able to lay a scratch on him, let alone inflict harm. Julius's explanation shed light on the strategic use of magical armor, showcasing his expertise in leveraging magical abilities for defense. The gorilla remained in a state of shock after learning about Julius's magical armor. Julius, in a reflective tone, questioned how the gorilla could be unaware of such basic combat principles. Venom Zard chimed in, reminiscing about their battle 2,000 years ago, acknowledging the challenge posed by Julius's formidable armor. Julius acknowledged her as the sole individual capable of penetrating his defense. In response to this revelation, the gorilla, now infuriated, declared that he would no longer hold back. The soldier, sensing the impending danger, expressed fear at the gorilla's heightened aggression. The enraged gorilla unleashed a barrage of punches on Julius, vowing to turn him into pieces and bring about his demise. The intense confrontation escalated, with the gorilla's fury driving the physical confrontation to new heights. The soldier predicted Julius's imminent demise, convinced that he would surely succumb to the relentless assault. 
However, when the gorilla eventually grew weary and ceased his attack, a cloud of dust enveloped the scene. The gorilla asserted that with such force, Julius's armor or whatever he had would be useless, reducing him to a flat state. To everyone's surprise, once the dust settled, Julius emerged unscathed. With a calm demeanor, he questioned the gorilla if he was finished with his punches. The gorilla, taken aback, found himself in shock. Julius asserted that a fist would be met with a fist, declaring that it was now his turn. The unexpected resilience displayed by Julius shifted the dynamics of the confrontation, leaving the gorilla on the receiving end of Julius's impending retaliation. Julius activated his magic cultivation, unleashing a powerful strike that resulted in a massive explosion. The gorilla, unable to withstand the force, succumbed to the attack, and Julius casually remarked that the opponent had been remarkably easy, reiterating the earlier classification as a lower-class demon. The soldier, witnessing the defeat of the formidable foe, became overwhelmed with shock and panic, labeling Julius as a monster. In response to the soldier's claim, Julius inquired about the whereabouts of the supposed monster. However, the soldier clarified that he was referring to Julius himself. Julius, maintaining his composure, explained that he had already confined the bandits who had attacked the carriage within a cage. Assured that the immediate threat had been neutralized, Julius encouraged everyone to remain calm in the aftermath of the intense encounter. Julius had mentioned that he had placed a protective barrier around the carriage just to be cautious. However, he found himself growing concerned about their well-being. As he neared the carriage, a lady emerged, wielding a sword in her hand. Addressing Julius, she firmly conveyed that he need not approach any further. Otherwise, she would not hesitate to wield her sword against him. Despite the protective measures, uncertainty lingered in the air as the situation unfolded. Julius then remarked on the presence of a cat-eared swordsman, potentially a samurai. Venom Zard expressed confusion, noting that the context seemed scattered. Observing his surroundings, Julius sought to understand the reason behind the lady's threatening words. In response, she clarified that she was referring to him, labeling Julius as her enemy. Julius countered by explaining his intention to rescue her, revealing that someone had attempted to harm them. However, skepticism clouded the lady's response as she accused Julius of deceit. She claimed to have thoroughly surveyed the area, attesting to the overwhelming aura and magical energy, a power so extraordinary that it effortlessly vanquished demons. According to her, such capabilities were far from normal, and could only be attributed to the work of a monstrous force. Julius downplayed the significance, stating that it was not particularly impressive. In response, Harutora clarified that she was not offering praise. Rather, she accused him of harboring intentions to harm them when they were vulnerable. Determined to thwart any potential threat, she introduced herself as Harutora, swiftly unsheathing her sword. She launched a rapid barrage of strikes at Julius, aiming both upwards and downwards. Julius marveled at Harutora's impressive skill, but when she attempted another strike, he swiftly intercepted the sword with a single hand at its center. At that moment, the once intact sword shattered into numerous pieces, showcasing Julius's remarkable ability to neutralize the imminent threat. Harutora, visibly stunned, observed in disbelief as Julius effortlessly split her beloved sword into two from the top. She could not fathom the speed and precision with which he had executed the action. Lamenting the shattered state of her cherished weapon, Harutora voiced her distress. In response, Julius casually explained that he had merely chopped it. Amidst the aftermath, a girl's voice resonated from within the carriage. It turned out to be a princess, and she expressed amusement at the intriguing display of Julius's skills. Harutora, sensing the potential danger, urgently warned the princess not to venture outside, emphasizing the perceived threat posed by Julius. The princess remarked that Harutora, Julius's escort, was among the most skilled individuals in their country. However, she marveled at how Julius had effortlessly engaged in a duel with Harutora, treating it almost like child's play. Impressed by his strength, the princess went on to extend an unexpected proposal, asking if he would accept the honor of becoming her husband. Julius found himself stunned by the unexpected proposition. Harutora intervened, providing additional context by revealing that the person before them was their cherished first princess, hailing from a country in the Far East known as the Nine-Headed Dragon. Upon realizing the identity of the princess, Julius deduced that their recent attack was likely connected to her status. However, Harutora admonished Julius, urging him not to communicate with her in such an obnoxious manner. The princess intervened, assuring Harutora that it was acceptable. In gratitude, the first princess acknowledged that even someone as skilled as Harutora would have struggled to defeat the numerous bandits on her own. Harutora, feeling remorseful, apologized for her inability to overcome the bandits despite being designated as the princess's escort. She expressed regret for falling short of expectations in the face of the recent threat. The princess reassured everyone that everything had concluded and things were now fine. 
she suggested expressing gratitude to the gentleman, Julius, for rescuing her from the perilous situation. Harutora concurred, acknowledging Julius's role in saving the damsel in distress. However, Julius downplayed the severity, stating that labeling it as distress might be a bit exaggerated. Undeterred, the princess took hold of Julius's hand, expressing her fascination with him and stating a particular fondness for individuals of his nature. In response, Harutora, protective of the princess, warned Julius not to touch her with his dirty hands. Julius, perhaps playfully, insisted that he was merely doing so. They all boarded the carriage with the princess seated next to Julius and holding his hand. She marveled at the unlikely twist of fate that had brought them together, heading towards the same banquet in the kingdom. Julius, in response, acknowledged the existence of coincidences. Harutora intervened, cautioning Julius against presuming familiarity with the princess merely because he had saved her life. The princess, curious about Julius's identity, inquired about his name. Julius, taking a moment to consider, revealed that he went by the name Julius von Carlyle. This revelation left both the princess and Harutora stunned and surprised by the unexpected connection between the two. Julius, noticing the stunned expressions of the princess and Harutora, inquired about the cause. The princess then disclosed that Julius was renowned as the eldest son of the Carlyle family, explaining the surprise. Harutora, processing this information, concluded that if he indeed belonged to the Carlyle family, he must be the famous eldest son known for his reputation, making his involvement in the recent events unexpected. Addressing the assumptions, the princess dismissed rumors about the eldest son's capabilities, emphasizing that such hearsay could not be trusted. Intrigued, Julius questioned the nature of these rumors. However, the princess advised him not to dwell on them, emphasizing that individuals like him were rare, and moreover, he held the potential to become her husband. Upon arriving at the castle, Julius could not help but express his admiration for its beauty and grandeur. The princess, taking note of his reaction, inquired whether he was previously engaged to one of the princesses in the area. Julius, realizing he had forgotten about the engagement, admitted to the lapse in memory. Concerned, the princess questioned if he was the type of person who deceived girls despite appearing innocent. Julius reassured her, explaining that the engagement was not of his own choosing. He clarified that it was imposed upon him by his parents, and he found himself obligated to comply with their wishes. Julius continued to share details, mentioning that his fiancée was closer to his younger brother than to him. This revelation left everyone in a state of surprise, prompting Harutora to seek confirmation, asking if that information was certain. Julius responded by referring to the demon immortal, leaving them puzzled. Harutora sought clarification from the princess, who, claiming ignorance, mentioned that her knowledge was limited to events before her summoning. Reflecting on the situation, Harutora speculated that the cancellation of an engagement between a scion of a top noble family and a princess could potentially have negative repercussions for the country. Meanwhile, the princess found Julius's revelations intriguing, adding an extra layer of complexity to the unfolding circumstances. Julius swiftly changed his attire before heading to the dining table, where he was pleasantly surprised to find an abundance of delicious food awaiting him. As he began savoring the meal, a gentleman approached and recognized him as Julius. Expressing heartfelt gratitude, the man sincerely thanked Julius for graciously forgiving his daughter's previous imprudent actions. Inquisitive, Julius turned to Venomzard and inquired about the identity of the elderly man. Venomzard explained that the man was referring to his daughter. Puzzled, Julius asked if he had indeed forgiven the actions of the gentleman's daughter. In response, the man warmly grasped Julius's hand and continued to express his sincere thanks for Julius's forgiveness towards his daughter. Perplexed by the man's statements, Julius sought clarification, asking him to elaborate on the matter. The elderly gentleman then questioned whether Julius had forgiven his daughter for the alleged cheating and the subsequent cancellation of the engagement. In response, Julius affirmed that, despite the forgiveness, the engagement remained terminated. Growing visibly upset, the older man accused Historia of deceiving Julius. Julius, realizing the man was Historia's father, learned that she had assured her father that she had resolved and rectified the situation. However, the man vehemently insisted that nothing had been resolved, expressing frustration and demanding to know where his daughter had disappeared. He issued orders to locate her. In the midst of this revelation, Julius deduced that the irate individual was, in fact, the king of the country. Despite the tense situation, Julius could not help but remark on the elderly man's loud and commanding demeanor. Unbeknownst to them, Historia remained hidden, contemplating the puzzling turn of events. She wondered why she had hired a group of skilled bandits to eliminate Julius, yet he remained unharmed. Perplexed and curious, she pondered the unfolding circumstances. Historia, contemplating the decision to hire individuals to eliminate Julius, 
recalled providing a picture to the hired group. Instructing them, she specified that their target would be traveling in a carriage to attend a kingdom banquet, likely passing through the notorious Forest of Evils. Emphasizing her intent for them to kill the man, she detailed the plan for the ambush. The hired individuals, acknowledging their reputation as the most renowned bandits in the vicinity, informed Historia that their group comprised 30 members. Additionally, they mentioned having recently enlisted the services of a skilled bodyguard to enhance their capabilities. Upon examining the photograph, the hired individual noted that the target was just a lone child. Nonchalantly, he affixed the picture to the wall and casually embedded a knife into it, assuring Historia that the task would be a straightforward kill. Reminding her not to overlook the financial arrangement, he conveyed confidence in the simplicity of the assignment. In response, Historia expressed disbelief at the bandit's casual attitude, scoffing at the notion of an easy kill. Observing Julius in the picture, she could not help but remark on his apparent vigor and well-being. Doubt crept into her mind as she questioned whether the hired individuals had failed in their mission. Contemplating her predicament, Historia pondered her next steps. She had initially planned to eliminate Julius permanently and leave the engagement in uncertainty. Fearing her father's reprimand, she realized the potential fallout of a meeting between Julius and her dad. Anxious about the impending consequences, Historia acknowledged the need to prevent any encounter between Julius and her father at all costs. In her contemplation, Historia entertained the idea of resorting to a lethal approach, considering poisoning Julius's drink and orchestrating a fatal fall from a significant height. Convinced that such a plan would ensure his demise, she weighed the possibilities. However, her thoughts were interrupted when Julius unexpectedly arrived on the scene. Addressing Historia, Julius inquired about the nature of the discussion concerning him. He questioned her presence at the banquet, emphasizing that it was organized by his family, and wondered why she was meddling in such affairs. Unperturbed, Historia retorted, asking him why it concerned him, and more importantly, why he appeared unharmed. She probed further questioning whether he had not been attacked on his way to the event. In response, Julius clarified that while his carriage remained untouched, another had fallen victim to a bandit attack in the forest. Elaborating on the incident, Julius shared that he had intervened in the bandit attack and successfully rescued the targeted carriage, ensuring no harm befell anyone. Concern crept into Historia's mind as she realized they had targeted the wrong carriage. Anxious, she questioned Julius, inquiring whether he had fought all 30 bandits simultaneously and what had become of the bodyguards. Julius confirmed that he had indeed defeated every single bandit, leaving Historia to contemplate the apparent weakness of the hired assailants. Turning to Venomzard for clarification, Julius remarked on the relatively small number of bandits to which Venomzard responded, indicating that they were among the weakest of the weak. This revelation left Historia dismayed, considering that she had expended six months' worth of savings to hire such ineffectual individuals. Curious, Julius questioned Historia's apparent dissatisfaction prompting her to feign innocence and claim ignorance about the total number of bandits involved. Observing the unfolding conversation, Julius remarked that statements like those were usually made by the antagonists. In response, Historia denied any involvement in such matters, insisting on her innocence. However, their discussion was interrupted by the arrival of Princess Sakura, who addressed Historia, noting her apparent desperation. Sakura went on to claim that she had thoroughly researched Historia's activities, and uncovered a plot to assassinate Julius involving the hiring of bandits. Julius, perplexed by Sakura's revelation, sought clarification, asking her to elaborate on her accusations. Historia, taken aback, refuted the claims and demanded proof. Unfazed, Sakura asserted that the suspicious nature of the situation led her to gather evidence from a certain source. Sakura's escort, after apprehending one of the bandits, shared details of their interrogation. According to the captured bandit, they were instructed to ambush a carriage passing through the forest and were compensated for their actions. Surprisingly, they claimed that the mastermind behind the plot was none other than the eighth princess, Historia. In response to this accusation, Historia dismissed the notion, expressing disbelief that she would be implicated by a mere bandit. Sakura, however, found the bandit's account plausible, suggesting that Historia might have orchestrated the attack as an act of resentment. She pointed out that Julius had recently called off their engagement adding a possible motive for such an alleged act. In summary, Sakura's escort gathered information from the captured bandit, who implicated Princess Historia as the mastermind behind the attack. Historia denied the accusation, while Sakura considered the bandit's claim reasonable, connecting it to recent events like the cancellation of her engagement with Julius. Julius confronted Historia, questioning her about an attempt to end Julius's life. In response, she openly admitted that she had indeed tried to harm him. The tense situation escalated when her father arrived on the scene. 
Despite Historia's confidence that her father would believe in her innocence, he surprised her by delivering a resounding slap to her face. Expressing his disbelief, he questioned why she would attempt such a grave act, and emphasized the importance of following his orders. In a swift move, he ordered the guards to confine Historia in a cage immediately. Confused and distressed, Historia pleaded with her father asking him to explain his actions. Tears streamed down her face as she questioned the need to be locked inside a cage. She implored him to release her, expressing her unwillingness to endure confinement. In her emotional state, she sought clarity, asking if he believed she was at fault and begging to be set free from the confines of the cage. Historia raised a poignant question, wondering if her father implied that she had been in the wrong from the very beginning of her life at the age of seven. Inquiring about her fiancé, she discovered that the elder brother of the Carlyle family had been chosen for her. Her father, emphasizing the importance of lineage, assured her that it was nothing to complain about. Reflecting on her past, Historia shared that from a young age, she had accepted the concept of political marriages as her responsibility as an aristocrat's daughter. She pondered whether her arranged marriage would lead to a connection with a suitable partner. However, her expectations were shattered when she found out that the guy she was supposed to marry turned out to be the worst suitor imaginable. Recounting her experiences, Historia revealed that her fiancé displayed aloofness and was the least cooperative, even in school. Despite her efforts to communicate with him, he remained distant, proving to be the worst of the worst. Frustrated, she expressed her disappointment in dedicating herself to a suitor who showed no effort or interest in reciprocating. Historia continued her narrative, recounting a sudden change in her fiancé's behavior. To add to her distress, he not only called off their engagement but also rejected her. Convinced that Julius was the root cause of all her troubles, she vehemently asserted her innocence, maintaining that she was not in the wrong. However, her father, unmoved by her protests, instructed her to quickly enter the cage. As he attempted to slap her, Julius intervened, advising against a parent despising their own child. In response, her father accused her of committing a vile act, alleging that she had hired a group of bandits to take Julius's life. Julius, dismissing the severity of the situation, stated that he thought nothing of it. Persisting in his argument, her father pointed out the near-death experience he had faced. In defense, Julius turned to Venomzard, questioning whether he was genuinely on the brink of being killed. Venomzard confidently replied that assassinating her master was an impossible mission. Her father, highlighting the numerous instances of his daughter's disrespect towards him, questioned Julius about those occurrences. In response, Julius chose to overlook those moments, stating that he would consider them as if they never happened. When Historia sought clarification from Julius, he responded with a smile. Historia, feeling the weight of her actions, openly admitted to attempting to take Julius's life, revealing that she even tried to kill him during a class using her salamander. She further confessed to pretending as if their engagement never existed and engaging in infidelity with his younger brother. Expressing her bewilderment, she questioned why Julius would overlook all of this and continue to pretend as if nothing had transpired. In response to the tumultuous situation, Historia's father proposed the idea of re-establishing the engagement. However, Sakura, urging caution, advised against hasty decisions. She suggested that such a proposition might seem overly convenient for him. King, considering the political significance of the Carlyle family, believed that their union was crucial for the stability of the kingdom. Sakura pointed out that she meant Julius, the man in question, was destined to become Historia's husband in the near future. Julius inquired if she was still expressing the same sentiment. In response, Sakura conveyed that he lacked any emotional ties to his homeland. She went on to describe her distant eastern country as a truly splendid place, emphasizing its delectable cuisine and breathtaking scenery. Sakura was convinced that he would develop an instant fondness for it. Upon hearing the mention of the Far East, Julius expressed his interest in the region. However, King swiftly interjected adamantly stating that a collaboration between the Carroll family and the eastern country was absolutely out of the question. Sakura pointed out that the entire situation stemmed from the king's daughter attempting to harm Julius. In response, King acknowledged his daughter's foolish actions, but insisted that the country itself was not to blame. Sakura questioned this perspective, asking if he truly believed that the princess's actions had no implications for the country. She asserted that such arguments made no sense and urged him to recognize the potential consequences. Noticing the escalating tension, Venomzard remarked to Julius that things were heating up quickly. Observers in the vicinity expressed concern, noting the precarious nature of their relationships with countries in the Far East. They worried that if the conversation continued in that manner, it could escalate into an international issue, posing a serious threat to diplomatic relations. Concerns arose among the onlookers, 
with some expressing worry that the young man's next words might spark a war between the two countries. Julius quickly dispelled any expectations of rekindling his engagement with Historia, causing King to feel disheartened. In response, Sakura inquired if Julius would consider marrying her instead. However, Julius clarified that he had just met Sakura and had no immediate intentions of pursuing a romantic relationship. Nonetheless, he suggested starting off as friends. To symbolize goodwill, Julius initiated a handshake between King and Sakura, urging them to get along and avoid conflict because of him. The spectators speculated on the potential alliance between the two countries, considering the handshake as a sign of unity. Julius, turning to Sakura, sought her opinion on the matter. She, being familiar with the country where Julius grew up, expressed her acceptance of the idea, indicating that it seemed like a reasonable proposition. King pondered the potential benefits, realizing that accepting the proposal could compensate for the loss of the Carlisle family and foster a positive relationship with the country in the Far East. Expressing gratitude to Julius for the suggestion, King enthusiastically proposed forming an alliance between the two nations. The assembled individuals joyously welcomed this proposition, and Julius expressed satisfaction with the positive outcome. Meanwhile, as the hero Julius worked on finding new ways for the two countries to engage in trade, something unexpected occurred in the magical forest. The gorilla, previously encountered, woke up once again, seething with anger. He expressed disbelief and frustration at how Julius had treated him, vowing revenge. Threatening to tear Julius limb from limb and reduce him to a mass of meat, the gorilla foreshadowed potential trouble ahead. At that moment, the academy principal, Iseres, arrived on the scene. Spotting him, the gorilla acknowledged his timely arrival and requested some of his mana, stating that it seemed like a process that would take some time. He explained that his combat powers significantly increased when he fully recovered from near-death situations. Emphasizing the importance of recuperation for seeking revenge against Julius, the gorilla believes that a complete recovery is the only way to achieve his goal. Iseres expressed sympathy for the gorilla's pitiful condition, acknowledging the challenges he faced. Desiring clarity, Iseres explained the situation in simple terms, stating that the opponent the gorilla had faced was none other than the immortal hero named Eugene. Although Eugene had disappeared 2,000 years ago, he had recently reappeared. Iseres cautioned that facing someone of Eugene's caliber was a formidable challenge, especially for an ape. Furthermore, Iseres revealed that Eugene now possessed the long-lost power of the Demon King, which had been embedded into his new vessel. This additional factor made Eugene an even more formidable adversary. Curious about the power equivalent to that of the immortal demon and hero, the gorilla inquired if the young one held the strength of the most powerful being in history. Iseres clarified that, due to the significant mana expenditure in their battle, the emergence of demons in the world had been triggered. The gorilla sought further clarification on the meaning of this revelation. Iseres explained that the successful birth of demons meant that he had fulfilled his duty. He admitted to introducing the young one to the princess with the intention of showcasing his exceptional combat abilities. The gorilla, feeling uncertain, questioned whether Iseres had taken advantage of him throughout the entire ordeal. Expressing gratitude for the gorilla's actions, Iseres conveyed that the sacrifices made would not be in vain. He anticipated that demons and evils would spawn individually, each possessing formidable power in their respective locations. Iseres declared that the time had come for the opening of the gates to hell, signaling an impending upheaval. Meanwhile, on the other side of this scenario, Julius casually enjoyed a meal and a drink. Suddenly, he spat out his drink, prompting Venomzar to inquire about his well-being. Julius responded whimsically, suggesting that perhaps someone was currently discussing or talking about him. Historia attempted to feed Julius with a spoon, but he insisted on eating with his own hands. Amused by the situation, Historia remarked that it felt like they were reenacting their marriage. In response, Julius assured her that he was perfectly capable of eating on his own. Sakura, observing the interaction, cautioned Julius not to get ahead of himself. Meanwhile, Historia harbored genuine feelings for him, determined to capture his attention solely for herself. On the other hand, Sakura was equally determined not to let go of such a remarkable man and return to her own country. The complex dynamics of their feelings and intentions added a layer of intrigue to the unfolding events. Venom Zard inquired about Julius's previous life and marriage, but Julius dismissed the question, citing his preoccupation with defeating the imminent threat. Venom Zard assured him of his support. Historia, suggesting they sleep together that night, received a playful remark from Julius. Sakura, in response to Historia's proposal, advised her to consider Julius's self-awareness. Perplexed, Julius questioned the meaning of self-awareness. As the group navigated their dynamics, they remained unaware that the countdown to the revival of the first demon was ticking, with only ten days left. 
The impending threat added a sense of urgency and tension to their interactions. Don't forget to like and comment for the next part. Join our Discord for the name of the book and subscribe for more videos from us.